That's that's my handle. I mostly go by Pine Sap, uh, not not because I'm definitely a griper without a uh, without a hint of doubt, but um, I kind of I kind of do Pine Sap more just to keep it like kind of general apologetics and maybe appeal to maybe non groipers as well as groipers, just so it's like a kind of general apologetics thing. Have you ever tried Retsina? It's the Greek resonated wine. Retsina. Retsina. It's made with Pine Sap. Oh, dang. Oh, you know what? I think I've heard of it. I've never tried that before. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. You got to try it. It's delicious. I mean, <clears throat> if you're not a snob, you can have it with Coca-Cola. That's how I drink it. Oh, that sounds pretty good. Hey, I ain't <laughs> yeah. no snob and I love Coca-Cola. So they do it. In. They do it in Greece. That's how they do it in Greece. My wife and my mm. wife is Greek and we lived in Greece for about a year and uh, the food's amazing. And, uh, you know, I'm not a big drinker of alcohol, but uh I sampled a few of their wares. And so uh, what's your background uh, ethnically? So I am mostly, um, you know, I've never done like a 23 and me or anything like that. But from what I know, I'm mostly, I'm mostly an Anglo um, and, and French. Um, I have quite a bit of German in me and I uh, got a fair percentage of Irish in me as well. There's a couple other smaller ethnicities in there. I, I even have a little bit of uh, uh, Native American in me, Choctaw, and uh, I believe Cherokee. But that's a very, very small amount, like 1% or 2%. Mostly Anglo and French, though. Ah, because I've had people stop me and say, oh, you have uh, uh, some... Native American because of the shape of my cheekbones and stuff like that. And uh, they said uh, Chippewa or whatever it was. Um, but Ojibwe, I think is another way of saying that. But uh, I did the I did my DNA test a couple times. I have uh, mixed uh, confidence in the natural sciences. And Spexo and I talked about this a little bit. But, you know, I studied uh, the hard sciences. I studied physics. And, uh, you know, I have some confidence in our ability to reason in this fallen world, but um, the DNA results were all like uh, the the British Isles and Scandinavia, a bit of Germany, and just a smidge of Greek, which made my wife happy. <laughs> That's terrific. But uh, so I like to get a little bit of background, like where are you from? How were you raised? When did you start believing in God? Were you always Christian? Or were you always Catholic? Just sketch the journey, if you don't mind, just so I can get to know you and my listeners can get to know you a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, where I'm raised, I'm just for the sake of privacy, I'm going to kind of be a little generic with it, just so I don't completely tox myself. Um, but essentially I'm in a, I'm, I'm in kind of like a mountain standard time state. Um, I live, live, you know, close to the mountains and stuff like that. And, um, I, man, I, I, I've lived in the same state my entire life. Um, I was born in kind of like a main suburb, um, outline like the, the capital city of my state. And then when I was about three, I moved to uh, uh, kind of the sticks, still in a suburb, but like it's so like kind of rural. I really kind of consider it like the 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 sticks for all intensive purposes. Like, yeah, we have running water and stuff like that, but I can be like in five seconds, I could be back in the woods in um, just complete and total un unadulterated wilderness, and it is amazing. That's actually where my uh, handle pine sap comes from. Is I love the woods. I love the mountains. It's always been such an integral part of my life. And so I, I just wanted to express that love in my name. Um, as much for my background, I, I was born, uh, in the, uh, for religious, I was born in the Episcopal church of America. And uh, I'm not sure, you know, you coming from Canada, David, you're probably familiar quite a bit with the Anglicans and stuff yeah. like that. So you totally, you like know the connection there. Um, it's very liberal. It's like a garbage fire, honestly. Um, I remember growing up and, and my parents gave me most of my religious formation as well as, um, some of kind of my Southern Baptist family members. And, um, I, you know, I believed, uh, that everything, it, I, I don't think I ever denied that everything in the Bible actually happened. I think I al always believed that like, Noah's flood happened and that everything always occurred, but I definitely was kind of nominally Christian. It was like, oh yeah, the Bible's cool and all, and you know, Jesus loves everybody and that sort of thing. But I never, 
um, kind of endeavored deeper. And then when I, when I kind of got to middle school, I got really into like Eastern philosophy and stuff like that. And, you know, kind of the, the interest there, I was a huge listener to, uh, the band Nirvana and I saw Kurt Cobain's like, you know, journey and stuff like that and how he was really into Buddhism and stuff like that. So I embraced, um, I embraced almost this horrible like religious syncretism for a while between like Buddhism and Christianity, where I literally said that like you could choose to either go to heaven or be reincarnated because I was just making stuff up at this point. Um, and then roughly when I was in my sophomore year of high school, I really hit a really like bad, 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 like patch in my life. And I just like, did not have any like real rhyme or reason to like why I wanted to be alive or anything like that. I was like, nothing really seemed to matter. Nothing really seemed to make sense. Everything seemed like fake and like it would fade tomorrow. And I was like, what is like actually static in this world? And I can't remember how, but I think it was due to the fact that that was kind of when the culture war was really starting to like rise up and stuff like that. And I saw especially people hating on you know, Christianity, especially. And I became obsessed, you know, I was always very patriotic. So I kind of became obsessed with like, oh, well, what are the like Christian roots of this nation and stuff like that? And I actually started to read the Bible. And I was like, I was blown away. Like my life was changed forever. When I actually like picked up the Bible, I'm like, Jesus is not like the sandal wearing like hippie that I thought he was. He's like tough. He's a, he's a king. He's a, you know, a priest, a prophet and a king, right? And he's like, actually like, cool. I, I like, I love Jesus. And he's like, mat, like massively like a warrior in my life and stuff like that. And it made me like excited to like get invested in Christianity. So I stopped calling myself Episcopalian pretty later on when I realized that that kind of was a designation for being pretty liberal. So I, I then started to, uh, call myself Anglican. Cause that was kind of like the more traditional like designator and stuff like that. But um, by the time like high school ended and stuff like that, I really started to take religious study very seriously, especially my freshman college year. And like Anglicanism wasn't really lining up for me anymore. Like the, the fact is, is like the institutional Anglican church is just like completely like doesn't even really believe in God anymore and says, well, maybe God's a woman or doesn't exist or this or that or the other thing. Um, you know, and Jesus isn't white or, you know, something like, you know, trying to do all this like crazy and goofy stuff. And, you know, there, there was the like Anglo Catholic movement that was like more kind of tradition minded Anglicans that were a lot more reverent and pious, but it, it like, there was a, there was a heavy level of sadness that permeated everything. It was like, everything felt like it was falling into decay and it wasn't able to keep up with the forces of this world. And, you know, it really got me thinking, I'm like, is this really what I, where I, where I'm meant to be? Right. And, um, you know, I, I encountered when I, when I came to college, uh, honestly, Catholicism for the like first time in a serious way, you know, the only thing I knew about Catholics growing up was, Oh yeah, that's that like old religious denomination from Europe. And I've like known maybe one person who called themselves Catholic ones and Oh yeah. Like pedophile priests and all that. Right. And I was just, I was super irreverent and, and, and I, I, I thought I hated Catholicism and stuff like that. And there was like a good reason why the Anglicans like broke off. And like, I just was so filled with like hate and rage. But then like, when I started to look into the Catholic church and especially my interactions with like medieval history and the crusades, I was like, this is like, excuse my language, but badass. Like, this is awesome. This is so cool. And I didn't, like anglicanism anymore really it seemed kind of like really like uh weak and effeminate and stuff like that and didn't seem like kind of like how i would ever imagine christianity but like catholicism gave me like everything i could have ever wanted and i, I literally i tell this story every single time i i talk about like my religious backing or something the moment that bro it broke for me was when I realized that there were seven books missing from the Protestant Bible, or at least the King James version of the Bible. And I literally called my friend, Mike, who is a, uh, a former Anglican like me. I called him and I said, Mike, buddy, you got to tell me, are there seven books missing from my Bible? And he's like, yes, Pine Sap. Yes, there are. 
And I like put down the phone. I put like my my hands in my head or my head in my hands. And I'm just like that I'm I'm done. Like I literally the next day said I'm converting. I I I it was almost like night and day for me. I didn't even put up a fight at that point. I was like, this is like thoroughly convincing to me. So that's kind of the long short of like my background and stuff like that. Very interesting. So uh, talk a little bit about if, you know, to the extent that you're comfortable about the reaction of the family during your voyage, were you keeping them up to date on your uh, journey or was it a purely private thing and you weren't sharing so much with siblings and parents? And uh, what, what do your siblings and parents believe today? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, you know, when I was still Anglican and I was becoming a lot more religious, um, my, my family actually loved it. Um, they were um, really, really like emphatic about it and stuff like that. They're like, oh, this is so awesome and stuff like that. And I think they liked it because I was kind of getting away from like, my more emo edgy phase of, you know, I'm going to be a bad boy and like break bottles and stuff like that. Um, and so really that, that was welcomed. Um, when I initially said I wanted to convert there, there was a lot of tears exchanged. There was a lot of, um, sadness, um, on, on the part of my family, because I think, I think for them, it felt like, I was going to be like separated from them or I was, I was like repudiating maybe our family heritage or something like that. Cause I mean, we're, we're Anglican going back to like the eight, like the Mayflower and like when it originally started. Right. So that's like quite a heritage to kind of like give up all of a sudden. And I think it was really difficult for them. Um, my mom especially had, had known a lot of former Catholics and had known like a lot of lapsed Catholics and stuff like that. I think it really gave her sort of, um, a, a sour taste for the church and stuff like that, based on what she was hearing. Um, and so it was, it was really hard the beginning of it, but I just kind of told them, I was like, I, I have to do this. Like, I, I know this is true. I have to follow where God is pointing me because if I don't like my life is meaningless and I, I have to do this. And so when I, when I told them, like, I got to do this, they were like, all right, uh, you know, we fully support you. We love you and stuff like that. It didn't mean it wasn't still difficult for them. Um, but I, I, I think that they really showed me such fantastic love being supportive of me becoming Catholic and stuff like that, even as hard as it was for them. Um, in terms of my, how much they knew about my journey, I think that they knew for a while that I was, I was delving more into Anglicanism, but I think when I suddenly said that I wanted to become Catholic, that was maybe a little bit of a shock. <laughs> um, and I think that definitely kind of threw them off a little bit. Um, but once I said that, and, and I think the dust had settled, they, they learned, um, to, to accept that this was something that I needed to do. And I, I, I love them all the more for doing that. I know how much, how hard it was for them. Yeah, I often think about, thanks for sharing that, by the way, but I often think about those who are going along to get along. For example, the lukewarm husband of a devout Catholic wife, uh, he'll drive her to mass. I've seen this many times, drive her to mass, pick her up from mass. He's not arguing with her. Sometimes he may even go to mass with her. And uh, this is a very common thing in, in Canada where the wife is devout and the husband is lukewarm. And I just wonder, uh, and there are also people that just belong to a certain denomination or religion for that matter, just because that's what the family does and they don't, it's just a social thing. And people like you, people like me, uh, Spexo and others um, who, I, this is not to put ourselves higher, but there's a certain predisposition that people like us have where we love the truth uh, in that sort of Socratic way and we are willing to sacrifice everything for the truth. And it seems to me that there are many paths to heaven, but uh, there's no, no salvation possible outside of the Catholic Church, obviously. But there are many paths to get there. But it seems to me that um, the love of truth that's awakened in us, for me, it was as a, as a teenager, um, the love of truth that's awakened in us uh, seems like the the surest path and the most explicit path to God and true religion, because you examine the fundamental beliefs that you carried with you from childhood, you question the assumptions and the axioms. And uh, it seems like 
we are on a privileged path. I'm not, to, I'm not saying that we're perfect or we're not sinners and all that sort of thing, but it's a privileged path to have the gift of God, to have that pure love of truth. Can you just comment on that and contrast it maybe with someone who goes along to gets along and has a more wending, winding path to the one true religion? Yeah, so it's it's one of those things where it's like, and I don't want to mean this with like any level of pride in my heart, but I almost like can't understand that perspective a little bit because for me, it's no like, like I just go if I see people every single day who have this like kind of emptiness in their eyes and have this like emptiness in their heart. And they're like, I don't like, like they, they're just saying to themselves, I don't know what to do with my life. And I don't know why I'm here. And I don't know what I'm doing, where I'm going like what's going on. Right. And for me, it's like people who sort of have this like lukewarm attitude to meaning. I'm like, how could you even get out of bed in the morning? Honestly, like if, if there was no meaning to life, why do anything? You know, I mean, everything at that point is just like chemicals firing off in your brain that might make you feel good for a passing moment, but it's mm -hmm. like, there's nothing in the long shot. Right. And, and so, so when I see especially Catholics that are lukewarm, and I don't mean Catholics that are on fire, but are sinners and are struggling, I'm that's the box I fit into. I'm a, I'm a massive sinner and I struggle a lot, but I, I I love God with all my heart and I and I try to get up every day even after I fall. Um, but like people who just seem like maybe they're not even massive sinners. Maybe they're actually pretty like saintly in terms of their like personal virtue. They don't really you know, curse a lot. They're not really engaging in like sexual sins or anger or hatred or envy or something like that, but just seem kind of like even keel or something. It's like you literally have the meaning of everything in your mm -hmm. lap. Why are you just sitting there? You know, it's like, even if you're, even if you have to start off slow, start off slow, but it's like, run with it. It's like a kite. Like, why not make that kite fly? Why not make that meaning fly in your life? You know? And, and so it's like, I have a lot of empathy for people, but that's the one perspective I've never been able to understand is like, you literally have the truth at your disposal. You know it, like run with it, you know, take that kite, take that trolley ride and just go with it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Get excited, people. It's just like the, the analogy that I use and <clears throat> it's, uh, I think it's a very apt one is that little spark of faith that we're given when we have these moments of conversion. Uh, I can remember to this day, the very moment I went from atheist to monotheist and I said, yes, by the grace of God, I said yes to that grace. And uh, the analogy I've always used from that moment onward is that this little spark is delicate, it's fragile, and I have to nurture this into a small flame and hopefully into a raging fire. Even Jesus said that he wishes that the, you know, the fire would just consume the whole world, the fire of this uh, passion for the truth and goodness that is God. And, um, and Jesus was God. So you can imagine the, the burning desire that he had for our conversion and our ongoing struggle to uh, leave aside the tawdry pleasures and our, our little selfish uh, sins that we cling to. I mean, I, I do. I cling to my little sins because I'm sort of half-hearted about my faith. I want to have my worldliness and please my wife. And I also want to please God. And it's a, it's a sort of, a, I'm like hobbling myself by not just being completely 100% uh, to striving to please God all the time. And it's, it's, just, it's a work in progress. And uh, the, the point I'm making here is that, you know, we have to advance, we have to strive to advance in our faith. If we're not advancing, we're, we are backsliding. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. 100%. If, if we're not going back to the cross every single day, we're walking away from it and we're abandoning it. Um, you know, if you, if you slow down, if you um, say, uh, you know what, this isn't for me or something like that, you're just gonna, you're just gonna lose it, you know? Um, and it's almost why I've, I've gotten to the point where, and I think me and Spexo have actually talked about this before. I, like, I still enjoy secular things. You know, I, I still appreciate like a good show once in a while and stuff like that. But like, I can't even like hardly watch TV anymore. Mm -hmm. I can't hardly watch movies, not even like in a, in a sort of like, 
oh, well, I'm so over it or something yeah, like that, yeah, yeah. you know, kind of a pompous, like haughtiness. It's that like, I literally can't enjoy them. It's like boring. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I'm like, I'm almost like watching. Um, there's a really good analogy, you know, and, and it's re that really good image that Plato paints for us. Plato's cave, right? Where it's like, I've seen the sunlight and like, I don't want to go back into the cave and like watch the reflections on the wall anymore. It's, it's just is boring and it's not even boring. Well, it's not even boring. It's like awful. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, I don't need to watch the, the latest Marvel movie coming out anymore. I, I, I don't need to watch, um, you know, this new TV show or something like that. Not because I'm better than anyone who does quite the opposite, I, but it's just more that like the truth is cool. You know, like there is so much to learn and to explore mm -hmm. in, in what God has created for us and in who he is. And it's like just kind of um, I might be getting a little off the rails here, but just kind of like going back to the cave doesn't seem at all to be an appealing event like endeavor for me anymore. You know, yeah, and well, so almost to like keep up that carrying of the cross, I I've progressively started to kind of like strip away that fat a little bit. Um, you know, I, I'm to the point where I think when I come back to like college next year, I, I'm going to see if I maybe don't bring my TV with me, you know, or I unplug it and like shove it to the side or maybe I, um, you know, I get rid of my smartphone eventually and I downgrade to like a flip phone, you know, just even little things that like make me say, okay, I'm cutting off the route here. I'm, I'm turning off the fountain to all these distractions and all that should be left is me loving God and praying. hundred percent. And we have to remember that even in Plato's cave, that analogy of the cave, it is a system of slavery. It is an evil demonic system of slavery. We can't forget that. It's not just a, a question of I like tomatoes and you don't, and you can yes. go ahead and enjoy your tomato soup. And I like uh, broccoli. No, it's the, the slavery of the system. Satan is the prince of this world. He's hypnotizing us, mesmerizing us, or trying to. And he's very clever at it and very subtle. And the, you know, big media, big tech, everything is in cahoots, wittingly or unwittingly. Let's hope unwittingly for the sake of their eternal souls. But uh, it's a prison system. And uh, I think it's almost impossible to not be in the system but we can't be of the system this is what jesus said right be in the world but not of the world that's the delicate balance we need to take but um that slavery that gray cave with the shadow dancing and on the walls we have to liberate those people and show them the fresh air and the, the sunlight and again not to have this messiah complex where we are so clear-sighted and all these sorts of things we too are slaves of satan but we've been liberated by by grace and by Christ. And uh, the fascinating thing about our journey towards heaven is that it's full of intrigue and twists and turns and betrayals, not by God towards us, but from us to God. Like we betray God every time we get distracted and allow ourselves to lust after food or women or whatever it is. So it's an ongoing battle. It's a very interesting uh, struggle that each and every one of us uh, is undergoing. And the, the evil powers that run this world want us to go back to sleep and forget about that eternal battle between good and evil. That's that really is the the good part of uh, COVID. And maybe we could, we could just talk just a little bit about the COVID nightmare situation from your perspective. I don't know uh, how you feel about it. Um, you're probably like me, uh, unjabbed and uncooperative with the, the tyrants. But I, I'll let you talk about your perspective on that. And then we'll move on to more uh, uh, religious topics. Yeah. So massive L. I wish I was un unjabbed. Unfortunately, I did get originally the vaccine, not because I, I, I believed it. It was kind of a complicated reason and stuff yeah. like that. I don't have the booster, thank goodness. But if I pass away because of the jab, I just hope that before that time happens that I can I can give something back to people. It it, it was awful. I and I, I'm completely against the the vaccine and in, in its entirety. It just was a it was a complicated endeavor almost. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. But the 
funny thing about uh, COVID was that was the time at which I converted actually ah, um, ah, okay. because I, um, so a lot of people don't know this. I'm not a, or I, you know, I haven't actually been like a Catholic for too long. I've been ah. a Catholic for about a year wow. uh, officially. And I would say that um, I wanted to almost become Catholic even a year before that. Um, and really that started with the fact that like, because COVID like knocked everything down, you know, and we weren't going outside and we weren't really like distracted with kind of like the pleasures of life too much anymore. I think it like really allowed time for a lot of like introspection, right? Because I mean, in those first few months, I remember those first like three months, I would say before things started to progressively kind of open back up a little bit. It was so like locked down and restricted and and just, you know, not functioning that you know, it, it, it had such um, a profound effect on us really looking inward and having kind of that silence to really like listen to what our heart um, was was construed with or conflicting with or where it was going. And I think during that time, um, I I really had a lot of time to like sit down and really think about like, all this stuff is gone that I like cared about. I got distracted by and going to these parties and stuff like that. Like, what do, what do I do now? You know, and like, what really is the measure of, of life? Because I think that, you know, people who are kind of like agnostic or a religious, they suffered a lot during COVID because it was like th this world for all intents and purposes is all that they have. Right. So when everything got knocked down for them, it was like, shoot well i i guess we're just gonna suffer you know um th there wasn't this level of like comfort to it but in a sense i think for 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 people like me it was like job you know it, it really was like job being like stripped away of like all the things that he had had and all his comforts and all his possessions and stuff like that and just saying all that's left is the spirit and i want to give my spirit over to god you know father receive my spirit and that's really, I think, how COVID affected me. Um, in terms of my state, the restrictions were not as bad as it was in other parts of the country. Oh my goodness, Canada, you guys like. And I'm in Quebec. I mean, Quebec is the worst of the worst. Oh my goodness, dude. And, and, and Quebec, like, how it went from being so awesomely Catholic back in the day <laughs> to yeah. then just being like literally the most liberal place in the yeah. world and seemingly like all of Canada. It's like, that is such a fall from grace. So I mm. like for all intents and purpose purposes, you experienced the like COVID lockdown worse than I did. In fact, I remember basically um, the red County that I live in and I have grown up in like, as soon as they realized everything was a bunch of bull, they were like, dude, we're not like wearing these masks and stuff like that. We're just going to go like hang out. And I, I got to the point where I was like, I'm not honestly scared of this anymore. And when I got Corona, like everyone was like freaking out and they're like, dude, you got coronavirus. How do you feel? And I was like, like, thank goodness I did. Oh my goodness. This was such a like overblown thing. It was like the flu. And actually I, as you know, David, we had to reschedule because like last week I got it again um, and I'm just coming off of the the, the slump and I, it was a little worse this time. But like even then I'm like, dude, like it's not that bad, man. You know, it really goes to show you that like the elites that wanted to lock everything down and shut everything down, they had other purposes. You know, this was not a public health scare or nightmare. It was just that they wanted to use this to affect what they they could have with like more time and stuff like that you know what i mean yeah i read uh, klaus schwab's book i didn't complete it because it's drivel but he says it's the least deadly pandemic in 2000 years but it's a good opportunity to implement all these forward thinking things for the uh climate change and all these sorts of things so um you know they know they know that it's just opportunism and they know that it's a lot of smoke and mirrors using fear to control people and uh, I'm I'm apolitical. I've been apolitical my whole life. I'm just a Catholic now that I'm you know now that I'm religious. Once that again. gives that gives me my center and my my standard of truth and goodness, and it gives me my principles. It gives me everything. 
but prior to that, you know, I was an atheist and just sort of my principle at that point was uh, the principles of Satanism, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. And uh, my my will be done. And this is a very simple, it's a very simple way of life. And, uh, you know, you also know as a Satanist that there are consequences to your actions and that there are other beings, ostensibly other beings that have their own will. And it could be a battle of the wills. You have to pick your battles and these sorts of things. But I think it is the most popular religion in the world is Satanism because uh, it's not explicitly referred to as Satanism. But a lot of Christians you see in the pews, even at a Catholic church, are in love with their religion, which is my will be done. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'll give some lip service to God also. Why not? Right. I mean, it's part of my culture. It's part of my family tradition. And yes, I'll go and I'll bend the knee to Christ. But uh, ultimately, it's my will, not God's will. And I'm wearing my St. Augustine shirt. He's one of my favorite saints. I don't know if you can Let's see go. it. But uh, he says uh, in the city of God, there are two cities characterized by two loves. Love of self unto contempt of God or love of God unto contempt of self. Those are the two world religions. And all the little labels and this and that uh, are really distractions from those uh, ultimate uh, fundamental options, right? They are. And the fathers talk about how every thing that is not the worship of God in his church is the worship of Satan. And that's completely true. You know, every schism, every heresy, every false religion, it's it's the worship of Satan at the end of the day. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, there's the this distinct verse in, in the book of Amos uh, in the Old Testament where um i i haven't read through um that part of scripture completely yet but i remember timothy flanders on meaning of catholic referring to it and it's god telling um uh, telling who uh, i i i think it's amos or or whoever is giving him worship he says what you offer like all the incense you offer to me is smoke like i don't care about it um you know and it's it's meaningless right and so that's how every false religion, schism, or heresy is. It's like you're you're not working for God; you're working for Satan. You know. Mm -hmm. I love this psalm. I forget which psalm it was, where God says, I, "I'm going to use a, a Latino accent for this. I don't need your stinking sacrifices." You know, he's like, "I don't. <laughs> am I? If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. You know, I, I don't need all the rams and the bulls and the sheep. They're mine." Yeah. Okay. Don't get too excited about these offerings you're making to me. I forget which psalm it is, but it's very powerful. It's like, hey, you're missing the point of religion, guys. You know, like it's not about sacrifice. It's about obedience, right? Amen. And act self-sacrificial love. So, uh, you know, I often talk about this on my podcast, the difference between faith and religion. And it's it's shown to us in the Old Testament and in the New Testament uh the the stark difference between hypocritical religiosity which is easy to lean on because it's just easier to have your checklist like yeah i went to mass went to confession i did this i fasted like for this many days i did this i did that and god mocks those also who are doing their fasting for their own ego and to please the world god mocks those people too like, are you sure you're fasting for me? Because it seems like you're fasting for yourself and for your, you know, to uh, for your status in the community, these sorts of things. God is not stupid. He sees through all our religious hypocrisy. But to have faith, to walk in faith, to be like a child, to to come to Christ humbly and uh, with innocence. Oh, my God. How can we how can we have a remnant, just a sliver today? of innocence, even in a child, when we have an education system in Canada, and I think in the US, that is actively corrupting the youth with perverted sexual teaching, right? Absolutely. It's like, it's, it's, how can we, how can we do it? It's like a miracle that we have young men like you, how old are you, uh, 20, 23? I'm 21. 21. Young men like you, making a commitment to, I'm assuming, a commitment to chastity, uh, if, if not celibacy, but chastity, and uh, maybe a vocation to marriage, or maybe single life or priesthood, I don't know, we'll talk about that. But how can it be that in this hellish fallen world, where pornography dominates, uh, even walking down the street in Montreal, I see billboards with women showing me their rump derrieres, and it, it's attractive. But I have to avert my eyes from an advertisement for clothing because they're not selling. They're not selling clothing. They're selling young 
well-formed women who are basically acting like horrors. And this is another thing that God talks about in the Old Testament a lot, how we, the people of God, are acting like whores. Like we're, we're just giving it away, uh, you know, uh, spreading our legs to ever pass, every passerby, as he says, you know, uh, and he's talking specifically about uh, the chosen people, the Jews, the Israelites. But um, this, this connection between idolatry and adultery is very fascinating in the Old Testament. You see it time and time again. It's one of the easiest idols to worship is that uh, intimacy idol, absolutely Sexu sexuality, and I'm very concerned about the, uh, the young people today getting confused about gender, so-called gender. I'm concerned about uh, pornography, people being exposed very young. I was exposed to pornography at about 14, and that's when I lost my faith. And I interviewed a guy, and I told him just a little bit about my how I lost my faith because of puberty and sexuality. And he said, yeah, I was uh, on my way to becoming a priest and I was having erotic thoughts while I was praying the rosary and I tried to fight it off. And then I said, well, what if I just give into it and then get it out of my system? And so he tried that route and he's now an atheist and he's he's a happy atheist. He thinks that he's found the true way. You know, he thinks he's found he, he's he's realized that Christ is a liar, lunatic or a legend or all three. And that uh, there is no God and that he's just an ape and that uh, masturbation is good and whatever. It's just like he's right on board with, with Satan's agenda. But he was there. He wanted to be a priest. So we have to be very careful with our faith. And we have to be especially careful about uh, intimacy and sexuality. So maybe to just talk about that aspect, if you would, from your own experience and from your own readings and studies and prayer and your prayers. Yeah. So um, the main sin that I've, I've always struggled with in my life is lust. Um, a little bit of anger. Um, I, I'm kind of, the thing with me is my anger is a little bit dangerous because I'm kind of a, a slow boil. I don't really like um, instantly get angry, but when, you know, you kind of like build, kind of build up a little bit, you build up that heat and that pressure. Like I, I blow my top and it, it, it ain't good. Uh, not that I've, I've actually never gotten in a fight or anything like that, but more so um, I can get so angry that like, I won't want someone in like my life anymore or something like that. And I've had to uh, sometimes ax friendships before. Cause I'm like, I, I just let it build up and it, it, you know, always kind of results in this kind of cleaving away. Now, part of that is probably that, that friend I probably shouldn't be friends with to be completely honest. And it's more just be me being a little overly patient but um i've definitely struggled with that but lust permeates the biggest cross that i have to carry in my life um i was exposed to pornography when i was about 12 years old um and i didn't know what to make of it um i almost instantly like hated it but at the same time it was like this um this thing that kept like calling me back it was it was this dark um like secret that i i had to struggle with um part of actually you know i shared my background and growing up part of the reason why i was experiencing such a bad depressive episode and even suicidal thoughts my sophomore year of high school was actually due to my pornography addiction because i was unbelievably ashamed of it um i was scared of getting in trouble i was scared of being seen as like a pervert or a or philanderer or what have you and i thought it would be easier for me to just die than have to deal with the shame of living with this anymore um and that is is really um a hard thing to to have to deal with um i wish i could say that those thoughts go away, but they, they still permeate a heavy level of life. Um, and I'm not, I'm not as out of the, the situation as I would, I, I would like to be. It's, it's still something I'm having to carry my cross through. Um, pornography is evil. And I think that the people that produce it need to be arrested and thrown in jail, like actually for the entirety of their lives. I think what they're doing is completely heinous um, because it, it, destroys so many people's lives i mean you have these um you know women that they traffic 
uh, in the porn industry. They have, um, you know, uh, men who literally lose like their will to live or their, or their flavor or zest for life, you know, kind of like I did. Um, it's just so absolutely disgusting. And it's like, I mean, honestly, like these people need to, you know, just go away uh, for a long time. Um, and it's, it's such a huge thing that we are having to deal with in the modern age. I mean, our lady of Fatima talked about this and our, and, and, uh, when our lady appeared at, um, uh, oh my goodness, Quito, uh, our lady of good successor of good fortune and our, our Mary at both, uh, apparitions talked about in this time, purity is going to be the biggest thing that people struggle with. Um, what with the advent of the internet, what with just everything going on in kind of the general apparatus of our society, it is such a unbelievable struggle that people are dealing with. And it is just, it, it's heinous, you know, it's a crime, it's a travesty. Um, I think the biggest thing that has helped me is honestly the, the, saints that have struggled with scrupulosity and i have a i have a particularly special devotion to one saint that i've i've talked about i i think before with Spexo, um but saint andrew wooters who he's not you know he never wrote a book never wrote a treatise or something like that but saint andrew um was a dutch priest that was actually laicized because he um uh I'm, I, I conceived a couple children out of wedlock. I was looking for the word, but conceived a couple children out of wedlock uh, with like multiple women and stuff like that. And was totally lay aside. I think was like even thrown out of his parish. And one day he's like walking along and some Calvinists are like, well, you need to renounce your allegiance to the Pope or you're going to die. Like it's, it's these two options. And he simply just responds to them. He was like, I, uh, he's like adulterer. I, I am heretic. Never. And he was hung and he died instantly. And went straight to heaven. Went straight to heaven. Went straight to heaven. And <laughs> it's like that that moment of like he he struggled with this addiction and this problem, but yet he he affirmed ultimately his faith in God is just so powerful to me. I, I mean, even Peter, who like there's this iconic and, and I don't know the painter or something, but I, I used it actually, I think in the first like TikTok edit I ever made, there's this painting of like Peter on the sea as he's like drowning and, you know, Christ like lifting him up out of the sea. Right. And he's just like at the feet of Christ and like looking him in the eyes and Christ like has him in his arms and he's like, I've got you. And that just like hits me harder than any anything that I can ever like conceive with words. I don't have I don't have words or anything from my heart to even compare to the beauty and love that comes from that. Wow, amazing! Uh, you've got a way with words. You must be Irish. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I I think I have quite a bit actually in me now that now that I yeah. think about it. Yeah. Plus the anger. That's an Irish trait. I'm. Irish, Scottish, English, Welsh, and oh like yeah, said, you know, Scottish like, and Irish. Yeah, oh, you definitely got that anger. <laughs> yeah, well, it's like you. It's like I'm just, I'm just very, very, very even keeled. But um, yeah, there you don't want to get that boiling point reached, and it's very rare. And a lot of the saints actually talk about this. There were examples of the saints who I think it was possibly. Uh, I, won't, I won't take a guess because anyway, I don't want to. I don't want to misattribute this to someone, but. Uh, one of my favorite saints was in a situation that was very controversial and a woman said to him like you should be angry about this this is an outrage and his basic answer was you want me to throw away in a few moments what's taken me 20 years to master my anger and you want me to just throw it away no I'm not going to. I'm going to continue yeah. mastering my anger. And uh, there's a time and place for righteous anger. And there are plenty of, of saints who have a righteous anger and that can wield it without the danger of falling into sin. But he knew himself. He knew his weaknesses. He knew the danger of giving way to anger. He's very good at being angry, but not good at controlling it or having a righteous Christ-like anger. So he just said, no, 
I'm not going to throw away this. I've mastered myself and I'm going to remain in control. So it's interesting. The idea we can learn from the saints is that they're all unique individuals. They all have their strengths and weaknesses. They all have a unique face recognizable. We're going to recognize each and every saint in heaven and our friends and family. And lo and behold, we're going to recognize our enemies in heaven, those who make it there, right? It's going to be fun. It's going to be really a lot of fun to see uh, some of our enemies in heaven. Absolutely. And, you know, something that's so powerful is the power of forgiveness. I, the power of, of, of loving people despite um, great odds in, in kind of our personal interactions with them. I mean, there is something so powerful about when we read in the New Testament, um, I believe in the, in the book of Acts, if I'm not mistaken, the example of St. Stephen, who is the first martyr, and the Sanhedrin take him outside and they're and they're stoning him and stuff like that. But rather than like getting angry and getting cross with them and what have you, he says, you know, Lord, receive my spirit. And he dies and he prays for forgiveness for their sake. I, I mean, I, I mentioned St. Stephen. What about our Lord himself? You know, Caiaphas mocking him while he's on the cross. And he says, if you truly are the son of God, you'll come down and you'll, you know, establish the earthly paradise that, you know, I, I, I want, you know, to see you uh, create on earth and l the Lord does not, um, act, you know, anger, angrily or rash towards him. He says, father, forgive them for they do not know. And I think the closest times in my life where I've ever felt, um, an experience of like, almost like, is this what, is this like what death feels like? Or like, I feel like I'm like dying right now or something there's this like humbleness to it of like you realize how fr like how stupid really having anger is and, and 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 you get so scared in that moment and you're like i don't wish this on like anybody like even my worst enemy i don't wish to feel this way um towards anybody or or anything and and i just want to forgive them and it's like that experience is so profound in shaping a real like uh, uh, deep love in the very like pit of your soul in the very pit of your heart um, is, is understanding that it's like even my worst enemy that offends me, I still love them. And not to mention the people that we do love in our lives and, and like make meaningful um, experiences and connections and really just give life its zest, its flavor, its meaning, like that is all connected back to Christ. And it's like, blessed be God, right? Yeah, you you now know what it means to be the salt of the earth, right? It's Absolutely. that flavor, that flavor, and the saints exemplify that. And uh, we are called to be saints. This is the universal call to holiness. Speaking of the universal call to holiness, this is a perfect segue into the 16 documents of Vatican II. Have you read any of them or parts of them? Oh yeah, have I read them? Especially uh, Dignitatis Humanae is probably my my area of expertise. But okay, yes, I Good. have I have Good. read them, and I gotta say I love them. Yeah, uh, I love them with all my heart. I think there's su it, it is such a holy council, and I think as um I I haven't read his book yet, but as Cardinal Mark Allet says, it's still unfolding. Like the Second Vatican Council is still unfolding. I the Quebec know. Cardinal Mark Ouellette? Yeah. No way. Yeah, he he actually probably has one of the best books written on Vatican II. No way. Oh, it, I'll check that uh, out. If you want to check it out, it's on Ignatius Press, and I think it's called Rediscovering the Council. And ah. he talks. Um, he writes for Communio, which is like a pretty good like Orthodox Catholic journal, and he talks about like how it's it's so relevant to our time and what the council fathers wanted to accomplish in the world right um in fact mass of the ages i i watched it um i think i actually finished it today um but there was a really good quote from that movie when um they're talking about saint john the 23rd's quote saying that he wanted to open the windows right to the church everyone hears that quote and says Oh, he wanted to let in, you know, the bad stuff and the, the doom and the gloom and stuff like that. It's like, no, he wanted to open the windows to let out the light from the church into the world. He wanted to, to make the entire world Christian. And you see this not only in St. John the 23rd's writings, but you see it in St. Paul the Sixth's writings. You see it in Cardinal John Danilou's writings. 
in um, uh, Cardinal Ottaviani's writings, uh, in, oh my goodness, uh, Yaquez Maritan, who I used to not like him, but he's now like one of my favorite thinkers. Like there, there was such, there was such this like optimism of like, we're going to, we're going to make the world Christian. Right. And it was that post-World War II optimism of like, Europe's been shattered um, and we need to rebuild. We need to rebuild it with the crucifix at the center and helm of all of it. And so it's just it's it's such a beautiful council. I love it so much. It's amazing. It's amazing to me that young, uh, if I could use the word conservative or God forbid, right wing people yeah. are in love with Vatican II, in love with the Pope. Not only do they, not only do you love the Pope, you actually like the Pope, right? Am I wrong? I love every single Pope that that will ever <laughs> exist or will ever live. I mean, I, I, I actually wanted to make a post on my Telegram. I don't even care if we had another Borgia Pope. Yeah. I don't yeah. care if we had another Benedict the Ninth. I would, yeah. I would readily die at yeah. at his feet if he needed me to. Readily. If you, if you're interested, I did a, a an episode on my podcast called our sweet christ on earth and it's about uh it's about um the dignity of the office but not only the dignity of the office the dignity of the human being who is pope and this includes the worst of the popes okay absolutely um and uh that quote is from saint uh, catherine of siena when she was addressing the the pope at uh, of her day trying oh, to yeah. to end that 70 year whatever it was uh, what's the term for that uh, when they were in Avignon, the Avignon type papacy and all that? Ooh, um, I think it was, I think it was called the exile, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. or like the Roman exile or something like that. It's got a catchy title, but I can't remember. But she, you know, she was addressing a Pope who had weaknesses, flaws, faults, little foibles, as every human does, you know, apart from Jesus and Mary, probably, but, um, I don't think I don't think uh, Mary had any faults whatsoever, but um, not even venial sin in the slightest. But um, you know, for the most part, I think you could find little little things in uh, some of the other saints. You know, um, so certainly in the popes, and certainly the popes who are not canonized, and certainly the popes who are looked on in Catholic history books as quote unquote bad popes. And yet she addressed this complicated sinner, this Pope, as our sweet Christ, my sweet Christ on earth, because she sees with the eyes of God, she sees the mystical vision of Christ and his church, and they are one. Christ and his church are one. And she saw the church triumphant, not only the church militant. And a lot of people today who are critical of the church, Catholics included, maybe most especially Catholics, Rad Trads and Set of Vacantus especially, they will always only focus on the church militant. And yeah, it's a hot mess. It's a hot mess. We know that. Yes. Look in the mirror, buddy. It's a hot mess. We know this. But in if we make it to heaven, then we'll be part of that perfect society. The church is, it's a dogma of the church that we that the church is a perfect society. All of the means of salvation are there. The church is one holy, Catholic, and apostolic. This is not a fairy tale, but we need to remember that we are the weeds are among the wheat here, the wolves among the sheep here until the very end. And in purgatory, there's a purification taking place. And in heaven, the purification is complete, right? When Jesus on the cross says it is, it is finished, he wasn't lying. He wasn't joking. He wasn't predicting. It was a reality. It's a mystical reality. Mary is body and soul up in heaven. She is the church. And we aspire to be her and to be uh, molded into her, as Saint Louis de Montfort so beautifully describes. So um, I'm I'm really really proud of you and excited about you. And when I say you, I mean the generation of young. Primarily, it seems to be primarily men in this Groyper movement that I've recently discovered. It seems to be primarily men, and uh, I'm just very proud that you've seen through the flim flam of Satan with the hypocritical whitewashed tombs who are holier than thou saying, oh, yeah. the good old days, the saints never farted and they were perfect and this and that and the other thing. It's like, no, we live in reality. Reality is we are in a fallen world. We're called to holiness. It's not easy and it's not me. 
okay, I have to kill the old man. I have to kill me, so to speak, so that Christ can live in me. And uh, so it's, it's, it's a very special fine line that you're walking. I don't know how, if you know and realize just how graced and privileged you are as an individual and, and people like you uh, in this uh, Groyper community. And I don't know the whole story with, uh, you know, Nick Fuentes, America First, the Groypers, all, the alt-right. I'm completely ignorant. All I know is I see young men on fire for Christ, chanting Christ is King. And uh, it's like, sorry, I don't see a problem. Uh, I don't see a problem from my outsider's perspective looking in. So maybe just talk a little bit about that and educate me a little bit. What's going on? Um, do you want to hear more so about kind of like this generation that like loves Vatican II and the popes yeah. or more so like the Groypers? Do both. Do both. Okay, totally. Yeah, I could, I could, <laughs> I could cover them both. Yeah. So what's going on in the church right now is that, you know, I think people have hit a wall with the just like recognize and resist you know, drooling over Archbishop Lefebvre and stuff like that kind of bull crap. Excuse my language, but that's what it is. It's such a like flimsy narrative uh, about what's going on in the church. Um, it's it's like it's sad, really. I mean, I like I was legitimately when I became Catholic and I, I like was attending a society chapel. I had a beautiful mass. I had a beautiful confession. They had a they had an incredible library and stuff like that. But I was sad. I wasn't having fun, you know, and it's not that our faith will always be fun. Oh goodness. No. Oh my goodness. We'll suffer and stuff like that. But it was, it was this like sadness of like, I'm in a house that I don't want to be in and stuff like that. And, and, you know, I, I saw like Jay Dyer enter the scene and stuff like that. And, you know, he was, he was really like egging on the Eastern Orthodox arguments. And I even had like, I had like a crisis of faith. I was like, did I, did I choose the one true church? Right. Did I, maybe I should have been Eastern Orthodox and stuff like that. And I really had like, I really had such a moment of crisis, especially at the time of Traditiones Custodes coming out where I was like, Oh dude, this is all over and stuff like that. And then my family and I took a trip to South Dakota. I was kind of like away from the internet and stuff like that. And I really just like dwelled in my heart and and i really like prayed and and thought and reflected with god and i'm like it's not that this isn't the one true church it's that my conclusion is wrong and that's why i'm feeling this way and that's why i'm sad and so i i, I had to ask myself i was like what's my conclusion what's wrong with it well my conclusion is that vatican II is a huge rupture and it's bad and it's stinky and you know oh we need to forget about it or it's like the robert council of ephesus or it's like lateran five and we need to like put even though we don't forget lateran five it's still fully binding to us today you know it's none of those things it's it's a council it's holy it's orthodox it brings life to the church even even if everything is not fully like fleshed out yet in the life of the church right and, and I was thinking about this and I'm like, I became Catholic because I just wanted to have confidence in the church. And I, I'm like, how have I gotten away from that? And the fact was, is I, I was listening to these talking pieces, supposedly for tradition and stuff like that, that were moving my heart away from Christ and to this selfish interpretation of what tradition is. You know, I, I started to almost go back to fundamentals and I... I, I started, I traded my like kind of like rad trad heroes, like Archbishop Lefebvre or Bishop de Castro mayor or something for, um, Louis Veo, um, Cardinal PA, uh, Cardinal, uh, uh, oh my goodness. I'm trying to think of some of the other guys. Um, you know, Cardinal Manning, um, you know, all the attendees of Vatican one who, by all means, were oh they were traditional, right? I mean, they hated liberalism, they hated all the like modern errors and stuff like that. And I I read their writings, and they're like, Peter is the rock of the church, and Peter will confirm us, and P and like this church is integral, and we trust in it, and we love her. And I was like, these guys are the guys I should have been paying attention to the entire time. And I and I read their books um on tradition and stuff like that and i got a real feel for what tradition is and how the roman pontiff the apostolic see and the magisterium confirms that tradition you know it's not just the vincentian canon over here and it's like well you know 
um, if it hasn't been believed by the church at all times, we can just disobey, you know, that kind of idea. Um, and so like, I got all that stuff like uh, parsed out and I was like, I now am, am just a true Catholic. And I, I love the mass. I love the traditional Latin mass. I love the Eastern Rite. I love the Novus Ordo. I love, I love where Christ is. And, and it like made me happy to be a Catholic again and really breathe like life back to my lungs. And I think this is what so many other Catholics I've talked to online are experiencing. They're not liking this stuff. I mean, we even were talking about the new episode of Ma episode two, Massive Ages. I mean, you know, th there was some good stuff in it, but it was like, it, it just had to beat the tired old drum of Vatican II bad and Novus Ordo bad. And, you know, we need to go back to 1950 and everything's going to be magically finished. And it's like, you know, not that the 1950s are bad. They're still as relevant today as, as it was yesterday. We don't change as Catholics. We're the same church, you know, past, present, and future. But exactly the point we're the same church the church didn't end in 1958 when pope pius XII died right and and so it's like we're tired of this sad attitude it's like look you know i love the latin mass i love the Novus Ordo. let's stop having just liturgy wars and just appreciate the liturgy the mass the source and summit of our christian life you know and and i'm fully on board you know get those guitars out of there get yeah. that clown stuff out yeah. nobody yeah. likes that yeah. you know yeah. but it's like when we have that stuff out what we have is just a beautiful offering of christ to us you know and so many people are realizing that and you know people are rediscovering the uh social kingship of christ they're discovering that like the encyclicals from like pope saint john paul ii and stuff like that are like really based and awesome um like I, I think in one of them, he said, he, he's like, you know, it's a man's duty to like defend his country and stuff like that. And was talking about how it's like, it's legitimate to be like a warrior. And and I don't mean this is like a fed post or anything, but like, it's legitimate to take up arms and like defend your country and stuff like that. I was like, dang, this is like awesome and stuff like that. Um, and and re really rediscovering just the love um, that the saints and the popes had for for just the church and stuff like that. I mean, I, honestly, and, and I, I want to see if me and Spexo can take this together because I took the anti-modernist oath when I became Catholic and I, I, I live and die by it. Um, but I want to see if I can take the credo of the people of God uh, written by St. Paul VI. It's such a beautiful creed. And it like it's the source and summit of our Catholic life, right? It's like the church doesn't change. We stand fast to apostolic tradition. Like Christ needs to be king of everything. And, you know, sorry, not to make it about me, I but for for all catholics it's like we're seeing this group emerge where we're not america magazine where peter is liberals those guys are are fuddy get them out of here you know but we're not also like sspx archbishop lefebvre let's do, go disobey the roman pontiff and go do our own thing guys it's like we're just catholic you know i i literally say this i'm just catholic now i don't need to use trad or, or anything like this it's like i'm just catholic because being catholic is traditional and I think yeah. that's what we're seeing. And especially in the Groyper movement, you know, the Groyper movement to me really represents like, uh, it, and, and I sent a super chat to Nick that was kind of a little nerdy or whatever. I was like referencing these like archaic political figures and stuff like that. But it's like literally Catholic action 2.0, um, you know, because Catholic action, like by the 1970s, it, it just became like weak. It wasn't really what it used to be like in the thirties, like in the thirties, you had like muscly guys, like blocking police that would like try and shut down mass and stuff like that. And like, that's awesome. Like I want that Catholic action, not like, Hey guys, we're doing the after parish, like bake sale or something. We're Catholic action, you know? And, and it's like America first and the Groypers are like bringing that back. It's like this like muscly Catholicism, you know, that's always been there, but we just forgot about our own heritage. Right. And, and really I, I see guys who are just like, they trust in the church. They love the Holy father. They would readily lay down their lives for the Pope. Um, I, I mean, the guys in my chat, if Pope Francis asked him tomorrow, like, uh, like the Holy see is being attacked and like, we're almost having like a, a like, papal states war part two um i know all of us would sign up and we would die and and we and as we were dying would confess the um faith that we have in in, in christ and his vicar and so it is just this profound movement of the heart towards the catholic church and it's like we've almost transcended i i mean 
I'll just say this right now. I think we've transcended the lame, lame label conservative conserving what, you know, like conserving like Martin Luther, you know, conserving like these like Freemasonic writers that like brought down the like downfall of Western civilization. It's like, no, we're Catholic. We are conserving the eternal truth of God. And I'm just so excited to see where everything's going to go, frankly. It's amazing. I'm really excited and I'm pumped. And uh, they're very nice young men, yourself included. I had just, when Elon Musk uh, bought Twitter, I joined and uh, I'm reaching out to uh, Groypers there. And they're just very friendly, approachable people. They're not all Catholic, the ones I've met, but they're all, you know, they all have that zest for uh, for life. And they seem like, you know, just uh, enthusiastic and bright young men. I'm sure there's some women involved on the periphery somehow, but, uh, you know, it's there's nothing wrong also with having a little bit of uh, men's uh togetherness movement but i wanted to talk a little bit about the um the liturgical reform because it's deeply 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 misunderstood by the rad trads and the set of the cantus they don't seem to understand that it was a long process of very conservative bishops that had been in vatican one talking about the resourcement where we go back to tradition go back to bring more tradition into the liturgy they don't seem to understand that Absolutely. And then the Franco-Prussian war, war interrupted it. And then we have Vatican II. And they conveniently say, oh, everything changed and it's all novelty and this and that. And it's, what is this? What is this Nova Zordo? Oh, what is going on? Bogus they, Ordo. You know? They're completely disconnected from the, the long and arduous man hours, prayerful man hours. This is not godless baby killers designing the liturgy this is men of god who love and revere christ and his church who have been putting thousands and hundreds of thousands of man hours and prayerful man hours into looking at tradition how can we bring more tradition not less back into the liturgy which had perhaps become uh sort of uh you know as we see in the old testament they're traditions of men let's just face it there are traditions of men that creep in they're not all evil, but there no. are traditions of men that creep in. And we want to refresh the body of Christ. We want to make it something that's alive again. And so I think that people miss the point uh, about the liturgy. Do you agree with me? I completely agree. And, you know, the whole thing about the ressourcement is I think um, uh, I think Matthew Minard or actually uh, Richard DeClue, I think, has talked about it's kind of almost like a non-starter of a term because it's like designating all these guys who really like came from separate backgrounds and weren't really necessarily the same. You know, I, I mean, like um, Cardinal John Danilou is like thrown in with them and, and he made some comments that like, I don't really like and stuff like that here and there. But like a lot of his books are really like kind of based and cool. Like he has um, a fantastic book called Prayer is a Political Problem. And he like, takes a good grasp of like the modern world and like how Catholics can go forward um, in the modern world. When was that um, written roughly? That, that book was written, I would say 19, uh, ooh, I think like 1971. Okay. Shortly mistaken. after the close of the council, not too far after. Shortly after the closing. And it reminds me a lot of uh, Gaudi met Spez quite okay. a bit okay. um, about this, this understanding that in the modern world, we're, we're going to be faced with some challenges, but if we have prayer as our source and summit and follow the social kingship of Christ, we can really accomplish something. Um, he's got a fantastic book on that. Um, and his patristic work was really good. Um, and, and you know, it's not rad tratty to say that there were some sus associations yeah, yeah, here and there. Course, and I hate to use, Oh, uh, are we saying something? No, 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 no. I was just saying, of course, of course there were, uh, oh, there yeah. were, there were probably Freemasons, uh, among the Vatican too, probably. Right? I don't know. Well, and, and at the very least, just kind of modernistic types. I mean, yeah. uh, Ch Chenu was totally a modernist. Uh, Yves yeah. Congar, um, he he has actually some good writings. Um, I, I, I've heard his book, True and False Reform, is pretty good. I've heard his book, um, <coughs> excuse me, on tradition, um, sold by Ignatius Press, is actually very orthodox and good. But um, at the same rate, super disrespectful to like Gregory the 16th to Pius the 12th. He blamed the crisis and the church on them. 
And I was like, how dare you wash out your mouth, sir? Like that is just like totally disrespectful. You know, yeah. you don't talk about the Pope like that. Right. Um, and so there is a fair conversation to have about like Henri de Lubac, uh, Yves Congar and stuff like that. And kind of parsing out like, yeah, not everything was good. We don't need to uh, open our arms unequivocally to them. But also in the same regard, not everything was bad. There was an understanding that at the time, um, and and let me readily admit, I love Thomism and I'm not ragging on Thomism or kind of the tired old like drum of like Thomism and manualism or, or like manualism in terms of like overuse of the manuals. Uh, you know, was like just so predominant that it's good that it went away. It's like, well, no, those guys were actually pretty good writers. And I, I actually have gained a lot of spiritual fruit from their writings. I think what could be better said is maybe it could have been a little bit more parsed out where it's like, Hey, these guys aren't going away, but let's have some, let's have some Eastern Catholic, like Polemites or something like contribute thought to the church. Let's have some, um, you know, Scotists, contribute some thought to the church, some Augustinians, some, uh, you know, different schools of thought um, that are still fully orthodox. You know, we don't want to, we don't want to depart from what the church teaches, but just contribute a great way of, of really seeing everything. Cause I mean, like, for instance, with like um, the, the history of like polemism and stuff like that, they were defenders of the immaculate conception, right? I mean, the Immaculate Conception of Mary that actually quite a bit of Thomas would reject. I mean, Juan de Torquemada, my goodness, he was a fantastic Orthodox theologian. But before Our Lady's Immaculate Concep Conception was like declared, um, you know, as a dogma, right, he rejected it. But then you have guys like St. Gregory Palamas, um, a holy and venerable saint who, you know, believe in Our Lady's Immaculate Conception, right? And even, um, you know, he's a schismatic and stuff like that. But even Mark of Ephesus at the Council of Florence, I believe, upheld the Immaculate Conception. And so it's like, you know, Catholicism draws from the fruits of all these different schools. And I think the Resource Mont definitely did have some fantastic fruits to offer. And there were there were some arborant elements readily admitted. But um, that idea of like going back to patristics or going back to tradition or having just kind of a fully orthodox, but just sort of al alternative like view or what have you um, of uh, uh, thought being contributed to the life of the church and the faith, I think is fully beneficial to her life. The image, the image I like to use of the mystical element of the church and it's an essential element. It is the element of the church is the mystical element. The, the image I like to use is a, I'm not a golfer, but I like to use the image of a golfer the best golfer. Okay. It's God. I'll give you a hint. It's God. So God's the best golfer. And you know, his caddy is a human, a fallen human in the fallen world. And so he reaches to find the most appropriate putter. It's like a very expensive uh, golf club. I don't know anything about golf, but I'm just using this analogy, but God's just like, no, give me that twisted gnarly branch there. That's got like worm eat and apple half eaten on the edge of this branch. He just picks up the branch and he makes the perfect uh, stroke and he gets a hole in one. Okay, my my analogy is basically a regurgitation of the old line about God drawing straight with crooked lines. And guess what? It's better that God uses sinners and schismatics and heretics. It's better. It's more wonderful. It gives more glory to God, period. And guess what? It's the dogmas that are protected by the very limited charism of infallibility. It's not all the fancy argumentation of the theologians. The theologian's a sinner, okay? His ideas are hit and miss, depending on how prayerful he is. His ideas are hit and miss, period, okay? If you can glean some pious thoughts from a, a biblical scholar or a theologian or a talking head on YouTube, great, to say, keep it what it is. Name it as what it is. It's just a sinner that's groping in the dark, period. And what the mystical body of Christ does is it takes the truth from this guy and from that guy, and it declares a dogma. But the Absolutely. process by which that the process by which those dogmas are declared, the process is not protected. The political opinions of those bishops is not protected. We should not make an idol of these sinners that contribute to the mystical body of Christ. Now, to the extent that they are Christian, they are another Christ. 
And so we have to see Christ in even our enemy, much less the, the, the cardinals and bishops, right? So we need to have a very clear distinction between Christ and, you know, and, uh, and the uh, fallen members that are struggling to hopefully be fully integrated into the mystical body of Christ here in this church militant. Is that clear what I'm saying? Like, do you understand what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. Oh, oh, absolutely. I do. I mean, like I said, like some of the figures I, I mentioned, like Yves Congar, um, his, I mean, like I said, his book, True and False Reform and, and on Tradition, even though I, I think he had some horrible theological opinions elsewhere, and I mean, uh, had deplorable conduct with Cardinal Ottaviani literally like peeing on his doorstep. Um, <laughs> he wrote some fantastic works that are that are worthy of praise, right? By the um, grace of and, God, yeah. And so it's like, you know, I can see the good in some of his writings. And it doesn't mean it's fully fleshed out. Uh, you know, Henri de Lubac, I, I don't really vibe with a lot of his political opinions, but I understood his element of like, you know, the, the element of Catholic politics is, is, is that personal element. It's the individual. But on the state level, Cardinal Ottaviani is correct. It's like it's the duty of a Catholic state to lock down the faith in society. You don't have that. You don't have the faith. It can't be like a, an anarchic like, oh, well, people could kind of just go in and out of being Catholic and the state needs to be secular. It's like, no, we need a Catholic state. That's fundamental. Um, and so it's like, I completely understand your point, David, about like, you know, really taking all those fantastic elements and, and putting them together. And I mean, it's it's what you see really uh, play out in the scriptures. I mean, think about Moses arguing with our uh, with God mm -hmm. and saying like, Lord, no, I, I don't want to, you know, announce anything to the people. Lord, please, I don't want to announce anything to the people. And then he says, um, you know, then I'll have your brother. Uh, oh my goodness. Why am I forgetting Aaron. Aaron? Aaron, Aaron, thank you. It was on the, I, I knew it was an A, it was on the tip of my tongue. Has Aaron speak for him and speak on his behalf? Did Aaron do anything else? No, but he was a great speaker, right? And so it's like, well, he did make that golden calf. That's kind of important. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> oh my God, that's hilarious. Well, I mean, it's, 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 it's tragic. But what a scene! What a scene with the with the orgy at the foot of the mountain while the brothers up the holy of holies, like you know, seeing God face to face, fasting for eighty days, and his brothers down having an orgy to please the people. Wow, <laughs> that's amazing! It, it's insane, and I, I think that image is is really what what you and I are talking about. Is mm. Aaron did some deplorable things, but he still announced God's word to the people. Right, he was tasked with that, and Moses. Maybe couldn't speak up, but he integrally kept God's word, right? And so it's like God can bring out such beautiful uh, uh, petals and flowers within us, even if other uh, parts are dark and barren. You know. But it's funny you mentioned Moses because he did have that one tragic flaw, which was wait for it, anger and impatience. Remember, he struck true. the rock. He struck the rock. That's true. So you've got that in common with them. So you're. Uh, you're like twins with Moses. I actually, um, I've been meaning to pick up an icon of Moses being given the tablets. There's uh, some Eastern Catholic icons that have been painted where he's literally being handed the tablets from God. And you don't see our, uh, uh, the father's face, of course not, right? But you see his hands hand down the tablets to him. And it, it's like visceral. It, it makes me weep. <laughs> wow. Wow. I want to talk about one of my Old Testament heroes, if you don't mind. Yeah, uh, absolutely the uh patriarch noah when i was oh, when goodness, i was yes. an atheist when i was an atheist uh, especially near the end i became a, an atheistic satanist i hated noah hated noah hated noah he was like the target of most of my hatred in the old testament he was like the main guy for me and now he's like one of my favorites i got a little icon i don't know if you can see it behind me but it's a tiny little icon of noah with his ark He's one of my all-time favorites now. Blows my mind. So maybe just talk uh, about how you appreciate Noah. Noah is powerful to me because I remember reading. Um, I, I remember my Bible reading that I started. I, I literally, um, when I was first getting into scripture, started from Genesis. And I think I, I'm, I'm at Samuel right now. And 
Mo, or Noah was unbelievably powerful from the standpoint that the entire world fell into disbelief. They, they didn't want to follow God anymore. And you have this one lowly man build an ark, you know, build this ark of salvation for him and his family and for all of creation so that when God purifies the earth, he will, he will be left. And I think that that like personal element to Noah in the fact that he, despite the pressures of a world that had forgotten God, chose to love God instead and chose to follow him. It's it's so extraordinary. I mean, there was even a movie made, I think, a couple years back about Noah that I I felt like was very faithful um, to the Old Testament. And in that image of the entire world is seeped in chaos and Noah takes up his ark and, and simply lives faithfully amidst the storm on this ark of salvation. I think what's also so powerful about Noah is how he is foundational in rebuilding the world after. And I don't know if any saints ever or ever written this, uh, about this, but I, I think I almost had this reflection just now. It really prefigures the fact that Christ will come to rebuild this earth at his second coming, right? I mean, his second coming is essentially going to be the next flood. It's yeah. going to, you know, there's going to be chaos. There's going to be falling away and fire and torment. But when he comes to rebuild the new earth, it's, it's going to prefigure the holy prophet Mo, or uh, Noah um, and, and the fact that the earth was purified so that he could live and his descendants could live, you know, um, in this in this purified earth that God gave him. I mean, what a gift from God, honestly. What do you think about the fact that Satan has co-opted brazenly and boldly the rainbow? The covenant with Noah. I think it's I think it's typical of of Satan, you know. It's taking something magnificent. It's taking something good. The rainbow is beautiful. It it is a symbol of life and and light and energy. I remember when I would have a bad day, um when I used to do bike riding in high school and I saw and and it would rain and I saw a rainbow in the afternoon. Having that little slice of heaven right there made my day. Um, it made my it made my world in that moment. And the fact is, is it is so unbelievably satanic that Satan would use the rainbow to represent a sin that cries out to heaven for vengeance. The sin that Sodom and Gomorrah was uh, uh, punished for this, the sin that St. Bonaventure says, you know, all Sodomites were killed at Christ's birth because it was so uh, such a disgusting sin. It's like how how dare you know such a beautiful symbol of life and freedom be used for drudgery and the sin of slavery you know and 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 especially i i i fret for the poor souls lost in that sin too you know i mean it's just it's the, the sins of the flesh are such a, a horse blinder over the eye and so i think what what we overcome that with is you know, really that, 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 um, you know, alphabet mafia use of the rainbow right here on earth can be overcome by looking at the real rainbow that gleams up to heaven and is a reflection of the light of God. If we stick to that, it is truly like Christ taking the symbol of the cross, a symbol of oppression and making it again, once to a symbol of life. It's a struggle. You know, it is a struggle to not be hypnotized by the inversion of hope because the rainbow is a symbol of hope. Absolutely. The inversion of hope. I see a flag behind you. That one gives me a good feeling. Okay. I don't yes. know what exactly it is, but uh, is that an old American flag? Yeah. It's the Betsy Ross flag. So this was the first American uh, flag that ever existed. You know, my, my family name is Ross, right? So that's pretty cool. Oh, I didn't even think about that connection actually. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know, we got the podcast with, you know, David Ross, Betsy Ross flag. I think it's a pretty good match. But my, my point is I'm not disgusted by that flag, um, but I am sort of hypnotized by the LGBTQ, whatever it is, flag, 
because, you know, I live in Montreal. It's like Sin City. We have the gay village here not far from my house. And it's everywhere. And it's just like oh it God. does represent the inversion of hope. And so when I see that flag, it doesn't give me hope. It doesn't give me joy. It doesn't give me light. It doesn't inspire my faith. It just crushes my spirit. And it just makes me think, maybe I'm just an ape. Maybe it's just, you know, maybe I should just get what eat, drink, and be merry and get whatever pleasure I can because, hey, maybe nihilism is the case. Maybe nihilism is the case. I don't entertain that thought explicitly, but it's just a background suggestion from Satan and his demons. Like, hey, mm. maybe religion isn't true and maybe, you know, or I could go back to my solipsism. I was a hard solipsist before my conversion. Maybe it's all just a video game and nothing really matters. Just do what thou wilt. So what I'm saying is I'm exaggerating a little bit. But when I see the symbols of the enemy, it's just so constant being bombarded. It's a tsunami of propaganda. When I'm flooded by that, it takes a conscious effort. This is my point. It takes a conscious effort to slap your face, wake up and say rainbow Good symbol of hope, Noah, the flood. And not only that, but be aware there's another flood coming, not a flood of water, because God promised there won't be another flood of water, <laughs> but it's going to be a flood of fire. Like you said, will. there will be, there's a flood of fire coming. So there's the hope, and then there's the sobriety, right? What does Satan want? He wants us drunk. He wants us asleep. He wants us just hypnotized. Maybe I can get away. Maybe this isn't really a sin. Who am I hurting? No one's watching. And, you know, my, my wife will never find about this because I'm in a different country at a business conference or whatever. Uh, I'm just making a uh, uh, fictitious example, but this is a very common thing. A businessman away traveling. It's like, what, where's the harm? Where's the harm? But when I was an atheist, I can tell you a firsthand story. I traveled in Europe and I uh, my train was separated during the night and I had snuck into the sleeping car so that I could sleep. And, you know, I charmed a young lady into letting me sleep in the sleeping car and then when i woke up in the morning i went to the next car over to find my bags by my seat and it turns out the train had separated right exactly at that juncture and so my bags went to italy or germany or somewhere and so uh i had to get off the train and re take another train and try to go find my bags and it was raining in italy and i was depressed and all my money was there and i'm wearing shorts because i came from greece where it was warm and it was like October and I'm freezing and it's raining. But then the sun came out and I saw that rainbow. And just like you, I had the that, that supernatural moment. I was an atheist, right? But I had that supernatural sort of hint of hope. And while I was uh, in Europe a second time, I had uh, a young woman. I was like into all kinds of uh, demonic stuff, New Age. And uh, I was reading tarot and traveling with my uh, wife on her honeymoon and uh, doing tarot readings to survive, just living like a bum on the streets of Europe, traveling around hand to mouth, living hand to mouth. But I was reading tarot in this one uh, occultist shop, like it's like a sort of a satanic uh, candle shop or whatever. And uh, this sexy young woman came in and she said, yeah, thanks for the tarot reading. That was wonderful. But now let's go to my hotel room and I said, well, I'm I'm happily married, you know, <laughs> just I'm on my honeymoon, so I don't think Literally. this is appropriate. But uh, by the grace of God, I said, no, I was an atheist. I had no reason. If I think about the atheist perspective, the, the, the perspective of a materialist, there was no good reason to say no, right? But deep down inside, you know, I'd been baptized Christian. I was raised in a Protestant church and some of the fumes carried me and I was able to say no to that temptation. Even though she was using good arguments, she was saying, well, she's never going to find out. I'm never going to see you again. And it's just a little bit of fun and pleasure and whatever. But by the grace of God, I said no. So my point, my point of recounting uh, these stories is that life is a mystical journey. And even, uh, even the atheist, because I was atheist at the time, even the atheist has the fumes of the, the Christian mor morality, the graces, and uh, not all of us, obviously, um, are protected at all times. I mean, there are plenty of people falling into uh, falling into adultery and stuff like that. But um, just if what I'm trying to convey to you and the listener is the mystical element of our lives. If we look back and we see the moments of depression, despair, and then we compare and contrast that with moments of hope and moments where we have inspiration or guidance or grace even as an atheist you have to admit you have the grace 
to avoid a trap. Maybe it was at that party where there were uh, some experimental drugs being passed around and you found out later that it was very addictive and very deadly. And for whatever reason, you said no uh, to that drug that was being passed around. That's never really happened to me, but maybe it happened to a lot of people. It's these sorts of situations where at the general judgment, we're going to be on the edge of our seat watching uh, watching uh, God's children pass very, very close to uh, the fall and to uh, to perdition, right? Ultimate perdition. So it's it's. A, I want us to always keep in mind that mystical element of our our lives because it's too easy to get blinded by the propaganda of Satan and to to lose hope. So that's the end of my rant. No, absolutely. It, it is so easy to get blinded by this world and only by the grace of God are we delivered, you know, from these, um, these awful, you know, happenings where, uh, by, by all reason and by all measure, like we should have given into this thing or done this thing or, or gone there or done this or, or chosen that. And God works on our lives. The Holy spirit works in our hearts to make us say no or say yes to something good. Mm. And it's like, at that point you realize, you know, I don't need to like see, um, you know, some, some, uh, miracle like St. Generis's, uh, blood liquefying mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. at this time in the year. I I've had a miracle in my own life, you yeah. know, I, yeah. I, I mean, that's just, that's a powerful, like, um, <laughs> reflection to meditate on is like, yeah. I had a miracle happen in my own life. I remember at RCIA, they went around the circle and they're like oh everyone just name the your favorite miracle the biggest miracle you can think of in his in the whole history uh and everyone named these really wild miracles and then it came around to me and i hadn't really uh prepared for this but it just occurred to me i said my conversion that's the biggest miracle and everyone's like what oh yeah yeah you're right <laughs> you know I mean? it's like yeah it's it sounds very self-centered <laughs> But it's true. You know, it is true. And uh, if we think about the angels rejoicing over the conversion of one sinner and that lost penny or whatever it was, it's like, it's amazing. The grace of God's amazing. It's so amazing. And and the fact is, I there's that old quote from St. John Henry Newman um, that, that says, God would rather that the stars fall out of the sky than for one person to sin against him and to and for him to lose that one that one soul. I mean, it just shows you that it's like God loves not not just us collectively, not just us as the human race, but he loves you. He loves you, David. He loves me. He loves all of us. He loves Spexo. He loves every single one of us as 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 broken and as messed up as we are. He loves us. And like sitting with that, I, I man, I always get teary when I talk about stuff like this just because. I mean, blessed be God, right? I, God's love is so powerful and it permeates in our lives. And you see like a smile form on your face, like when you were a child again, you know? Wow. I I don't know if you can see it, but I'm, one of my projects is to memorize this. Can you read? Can you, are you able oh, to see prayer what for the is? gift of tears? Yes. And St. Augustine's quote about the, the gift of tears shed for our Lord's passion is better than I think he said like a thousand penances or something like that. I want it. I want it. I want it. And if, yes. if, if you're able, if you, it seems like you're able to access your emotions, especially with the pious religious movement of the heart, then I'm jealous and I want it. I want it. Okay. Because I'm my coping me mechanism in life. My defense mechanism has been to live right here in my head. That's my defense. That's my safe space. Right. But there's nothing better than being fully alive. That's the glory of God is man fully alive. So we have to be in the heart. The heart is the wholeness of the person. Right. Can I get a book from my shelf real quick? Yeah. I've got to show you. Yeah. I got this book um, not too long ago. And it like even just reading the first homily from Saint Charbel, it's it's changed my life, and I can see like why he's the patron saint of like uh, Lebanon now, and yeah. like the entire Maronite people. Um, love is a radiant light, 
Mm. Um, and it's it's the life and it's the words of Saint Charbel. And his first homily talks about he he takes this the creation story of Genesis, but he he reflects on how you know God is not just loving, God is love, right? And he says, in the beginning was love, you know, and and, and love um is the existence of all things, and nothing can exist outside of love, right? And I think if you really like get this book and and follow mm. Saint Charbel, follow the saints, um, you know, Saint Teresa of Lisieux, um, and all the saints that like loved God with all their heart, David, I think you'll get the tears, uh, uh, the gift of tears instantly, you know? Nice, nice. The things that move me, the things that move me to tears are, uh, you know, a genuine, sincere, self sacrificial love when i see that it moves me to tears and uh, surprisingly or maybe not surprisingly uh a melody like a certain melody you know it happens to me sometimes just with the organ at church right yes. it's just like how can that move me how is that what is going on why am i moved by this particular melody what is going on you know but we all we all are subject to that to a greater or lesser extent right absolutely well and there's a reason why I believe St. Pius X actually said this was the reason why he banned all instruments like except the pipe organ um, was because God has given us an instrument and it's our it's our voice, voice, voice. right? It's the best. And it's, it's, the best. It, it's the song of the birds. It's the <laughs> wind through the trees. It's like that is our that is our true music. It's and funny. Oh, go, go right ahead. Well, I just want I didn't want to interrupt you, but, you know, uh, and without revealing too much of my intimate uh, married life, but I will say this much on my wedding night, uh, for whatever reason, I just in that loving atmosphere, like I found my my soulmate, my better half and spontaneously we have this love language and it, it it's with us to this day. Every day we're speaking to each other with this love language that no one else is privy to, but it's called birdie language because we just whistle to each other with these little sweet little whispers, uh, whistles. Okay. So our vocabulary is about six words. It's or six phrases. It's, I love you. I'm sorry. Uh, hello. Uh, you know, it's like a, a handful of things to communicate, but that's how I think also about my relationship with God. It's like, thank you. I love you. I'm sorry. And please help me. You know, that that's the gist of my prayer life right there in four basic components. And it's just ironic that you talked about the song, uh, uh, the love song, the voice, the birds. And that that's something very special and uh, touching to me in my romantic relationship. And it's always been uh something that warms my heart in the saints when when i read about the nuptial love for christ and you know this idea that we are the bride of christ especially the women religious they can exemplify that very perfectly and mary of course exemplifies that perfect perfectly being the daughter but also also uh the mother also the spouse you know of the three persons of the trinity and uh so this this brings me back to the question of intimacy and how Satan inverts everything that's good and holy. Intimacy being right up there near the top, if not the top spot, because we are to have an intimacy and a, 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 a perfect selfless self-giving of person, the whole person from the heart to Jesus Christ. And that includes his church because Christ and his church are one flesh, right? So maybe talk about that intimacy and without being too crass, if we could talk about it in terms of sexuality with Christ. And it, it is a little bit dangerous to talk in that way, but I'm sure you've read in some of the saints how they are uh, careful, but also explicit about the fact that there's, there's a bliss in that intimacy and that union with Christ and his church, right? Absolutely. Um you know, really with with the intimacy that we experience with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we realize that God is personal. He's not impersonal. Um, you know, this was something that the deists, this was their heresy. You know, the idea that God was like this like clock, like Greek clock God or something. I, I know some of them like believed in that where, you know, he kind of made everything, but he's not really like interested in us. He's over at the far edge of the universe, focusing on something else. 
that's not the God we worship. Um, God, Yahweh, I am who I am. Mm -hmm. He's saying something to us by his, his very name. I am who I am. Mm, love it. He's presenting himself to us. And he wants us to present him, ourselves to him, even in all our brokenness. And I think the fact is that, you know, when we call God our father, it, it is so true because think about in, in our own lives, um, and I don't want to presume to anyone listening if, if, if you've had a bad relationship with your, your father or, or, or not, but, you know, a father loves his son um, un, 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 unadultered, right? He, he loves his son. There's no limit to his love. There's no prescriptions. His son could commit the worst crime in the world and he would still love his son. He's still flesh of his flesh, right? And bone of his bone. And he made his son. And in that same way, God the Father loves us because God the Father made us. St. Francis de Sales, an in introduction to the devout life, says that God literally had no reason for making us. He's happy because he is happiness and he is joy. He's happy by himself. He doesn't need us. So why are you here? He made you because he loves you specifically. Not, not, you know, you in generalities, oh, I, you know, I love all of you equal, but like kind of almost in this communistic, impersonal, like, no, he loves you. He loves you personally. And he has so, he has so much of that love for you that it overflows to everybody, to the whole of the human family, right? But he loves every single one of us personally. And that deep movement of the heart is so integral to understanding that God is love, that when we pray to God, it's because God, you know, it's not just checking a box. Like I, and I get stuck in this too. You know, it's like, Oh, got to say my night prayer. Got to say my morning prayer. No, don't do that. You're talking to your father who loves you. You're having a conversation with your father. Your father wants to know how you're doing. How are you? I love you. Tell him about your day and even, you know, pray to God, like you talk to your dad, you know, and, 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 and feel that, that personal nature to it. Don't feel like you always have to address God in these like very, you know, uh, 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 sort of like haughty prayers, you know, of, of using like old English or something like that, or even Latin. It's like make prayer the movement of the heart. It can be as simple as making the sign of the cross and spending an hour just talking to Jesus, talking to God, the father and the Holy spirit. You know, you don't have to, you know, make it into all these uh, rhythms and rhymes because God just wants to talk to you. He wants to just love you, you know? Mm, so sure. it's like, take that time to love him. And I, oh, um, go right ahead, David. <laughs> no, I just wanted to respond to the sign of the cross because it's my favorite prayer because it's silent. Because as I told you, I live in my head a bit, bit of an introvert. And uh, if I can get away from my own stupid uh, thoughts, so much the better. So the sign of the cross for me is a silent prayer. It says a lot about the Trinity, about the incarnation, about everything. And it's just very, very powerful. And it's, it's, it's a manifestation of my love where it's kind of like I can give a little gift to Jesus. And I know it's untarnished by my stupid human way of thinking and my ego where it's always about me. Cause when I'm praying with words, it's just that, that uh that inner dialogue that's just sick you know it's just not i'm not a saint so i've got lots of baggage and lots of issues and stuff like that so when i'm praying with words it's mixed up with all that crap but when i do the sign of the cross it's just like i'm giving him a little present and uh it's it's more pure and innocent and i love it and i love the sweet little uh, ejaculatory prayers, as we call them, just the I love yous, just like I would do with my wife. Like, it's just, it's simple. I love you and uh, thank you. Like, it's the power of that, that pure, simple, childlike prayer. And um, I, I just love it. So I'm glad you mentioned the, the sign of the cross that we can start with just with a simple thing like that and just put ourselves in the presence of God. All, this, all the saints talk about this in the prayer life, just putting ourselves, reminding yourself. And I need to be reminded. So thank you for reminding me because with me, with my fixed prayers, it's like I do about an hour a day of fixed prayers. 
but it's always just a panic to get through. I just got to get through this. I got to get through this. I got to get through this. Why? What do you, what's more important? What are, what's, why, why am I in a hurry? And I know it's just because I'm in the world and I'm of the world and I've got, you know, it's just, it's just a bad habit and it's a lack of, a uh, lack of discipline, a lack of love, a lack of commitment, and a lack of faith, a lack of trust in God, right? So do what maybe I don't want to have that intimacy. Maybe I don't want that full intimacy, right? Because like a lot of the uh, prophets are like, I don't want to, <laughs> you talked about Moses, but a lot of them were like, I don't want to speak for you. I don't want to contradict the powerful people who can hurt me. <laughs> I don't want to contradict them. Right. So I think there is a little bit of that fear in me and uh, probably in a lot of uh, a lot of Catholics that uh, that do love God as I, I love God, but maybe a little bit shy to give my life completely because then it's dangerous. It's real. It's alive. It's this faith that's out of the box. Like right now, I've got it in a nice box. Like I got to do my prayers. I do my I do my sacraments. I like it's all a checkbox thing and it's all well controlled. It's my project. Oh, what are you going to do to improve your your prayer life? Oh, I can. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to avail myself of the sacraments in a more worthy manner, and I'm going to do this and that. And that's all good. It's all good, but it's me with my stupid project. And so, what I'm striving for, hoping for by the grace of God, is to just be free of that and to be uh, authentically uh, simple and direct with God, like you're saying, and to be like uh, be childlike, you know and uh to take the plunge or take the leap of faith and in my romantic life a lot of people were surprised like i'd only known this woman a, a short period of time like uh, a couple of months and we moved in together we got married and just like just like i was not afraid to take the plunge so i know i have it in me the foolishness or the childlike spontaneity or whatever you want to call it impulsiveness or whatever i have i'm willing to risk everything for god i know that but day to day with the drudgery of daily life, paying the bills and all this sort of thing, uh, there's a tendency tendency for me to want to clamp down and control my faith walk or my religiosity. Can you relate to that in any way? I think so. Um, I have a real fear. I think of sometimes saying like, I want God to take over because I think I, know how that's going to look. And I don't always know if I'm ready for that. <laughs> um, you know, I, I always hear um, in the gospels, you know, Jesus talking about, you know, if you love me, you'll hold my command, you'll keep my commandments. Yeah. If you love me, you'll sell everything you, you own and you'll follow me. And I think that's extremely true but I'm scared of, about that. You know, I, 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 I'm, I'm like, I'm young, you know, I, I like my things. I don't want to sell my things. I, you know, I, um, you know, I, I want to follow Jesus in this comfortable little box and stuff like that. But I think the truth of the matter and, and what, what I'm going to have to face one day and I'm, I'm scared for, but I think it'll be the most freeing thing is finally saying, I'm giving everything up and I'm going to follow God. Mm. And, you know, that's not going to look the same for me or you, David, or anybody else. But I think taking that full plunge, you know, like, like you almost think about when you plunge into a cold lake or something like that, and it, it, it kind of stings you a little bit, but th there's this like freedom that comes after of like you acclimatize the water and you almost feel great. You feel alive. I think that that will happen in our lives and that it will manifest itself in such a profound way, but we have to be willing either now or later to be able to take that jump, take that plunge. Yeah. You know, the church, the church is a wise and loving mother and an understanding mother and the church does moderate a lot of the impulsiveness that may be, an enthusiastic young convert might have, I'm going to yes. go to Africa and it's over there. Like the vision of the, what, what did the saints do? I'm going to emulate the saints. And one of my favorite saints is Saint uh, Jose Maria Escriva of the Opus Dei. Oh yeah. You know, it's like, Hey, dial it back and look at your actual context. 
Why are you neglecting your wife and kids? Why are you neglecting your, your studies? Why are you neglecting your work? Hey, you want to be Catholic? You're already exactly where God wants you to be, to be sanctified. And one of his favorite quotes uh, of St. Jose Maria Escava is, uh, don't say that person annoys me, say that person sanctifies me. So the path to sanctification can be through the drudgery of work and applying ourselves, but it can also be by putting up with a lot of really annoying people and they're everywhere. They are everywhere. And so if you can picture them like little spiritual dollar signs, like, oh, here comes that annoying lady. Yeah, here she comes. Like, thank you, God. It's just san more sanctification. Now, this is something that excites me. It's kind of like uh, the little way, St. Therese de Lisieux. You know, it's that little way, like uh, pick up a pin for Jesus. And that's, you know, if it's done with hurt, that's the way. I, I, I think that embracing these little opportunities... Uh, rather than fantasizing, oh, I'm going to be a murderer. I hope the Muslims take over and they chop my head off because I'm Christian. You know, that's just a fantasy. And it could happen. I mean, I, I actually hope it does happen. <laughs> but it's like sure way to go straight to heaven because I do not want to go to purgatory. But, um, you know, my ultimate realistic dream uh, as a Catholic, my walk with God, my realistic ambition is to embrace ordinary suffering boredom in mild inconveniences those are sometimes the worst right it's just like hey i want to do this thing and it's like just this little aggravation that's preventing me from accomplishing this small thing which is part of a part of a bigger thing it's like that's a spiritual dollar sign that's gold that's a treasure in heaven and you're wasting it you're turning it from a godly exercise into a satanic exercise who are you to be frustrated and angry at this mild inconvenience, which is sent by God as a gift to you? And you're you're rejecting this small gift. So don't expect big gifts, buddy. Don't expect big gifts. You rejected all these little gifts, right? So it's all about appreciation and embracing the suffering and the, the mild inconveniences. What do you think about that? I completely agree. And, and I think that is such a unbelievably pertinent and true reflection um there is such a tendency to just you know kind of go with the convert zeal and have this this like fantasy of i'm going to do this and i'm going to do that and, and and i i suffer from this immensely <laughs> um but i think really that that is so true about what cardinal both cardinal menzetti and um blessed cardinal menzetti and saint jose maria said in relation to our sanctification is is through embracing our station in life um and we forget this all the time i forget this all the time you know i i always like to be like you know all oh, all this you know school stuff or all this work stuff that's just boring and i need to get done with that and then and then go on my way but that is the work that sanctifies us and and that is us tilling in the garden of the lord i mean that's i'm 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 definitely humbled by hearing your words um david i i, I think that's something i need to pray about and reflect a lot a lot more on it's powerful it's powerful because you are just surrounded by god's love and by these opportunities and these gifts it's like wow wow i don't need to wait i don't need to travel i don't it's like you know because the thing the thing about satan and his lies is that we look at we look at what the media is presenting to us and they're saying you know i i want to thank the academy and if you believe in yourself you can also have you could get whatever you want and i'm rich and famous and i'm i'm this and that even though i came from humble beginnings and you start to think Hmm. Okay, so there are two kinds of people. They're like the elites who are like famous, rich, nice house, nice car, all the women, all the wine, and everything like that. They're, and then they're the little losers like me on my couch watching them and admiring them. But the elites are telling me that if I believe in myself, right, believe in myself, that anything is possible and I can have all these things that I want, the pleasures and the status in life and all this sort of thing. That's Satan's propaganda. It's absolutely everywhere. And it's the inversion of what I just presented to you. 
this uh, Opus Dei vision of the, <laughs> the, the ubiquity of sanctifying elements. It's like, oh my God, this is again, Vatican II. The elements of sanctification are literally everywhere. Amen. Wow. Wow. We, those are the rose colored glasses as Catholics that we need to put on. And it's just like, you mean to tell me that this, all of this is so that I can become a saint, all of this. But this isn't, you know, my clothes aren't nice. My apartment's not nice. My job sucks. My, you know, whatever. I could, I could come up with all kinds of complaints about everything. My family, my even my wife. But when you put on those glasses, like it's like the mystical goggles, like you, like you emphasize, like you woke me up. Like, yeah, God is love. Don't, don't be too formal with God. Let's be intimate. Let's be in the moment. And then I came back at you with the sanctification in the ordinary and it's like we're building grace upon grace and we're getting back to basics it's amazing this is why this is why i do the podcast so that we can encourage each other and uh, build our faith up right it's just it's amazing and and god uses us to tell each other the things that we need to hear i mean it's it's so amazing when i really do think there's a moment where you're like sitting with a friend or you're sitting with someone you're talking to and that moment where they tell you something, the thing that you've needed to hear, I always, I want to give that back to God and say that that's not them speaking or it's not you speaking. It's, it's God speaking through them. It's God using one of his children to, to speak the words that you need to hear. You know, when your friend, um, you know, who normally just kind of hangs, it's almost like that move, um, that moment in the movie, uh, Goodwill Hunting, when, um uh i i can't remember who's the blonde actor in the movie i i i can't can't remember his name um but um he he comes back after he's like rejected um doing the, the like teaching position and stuff like that and he's he's you know this math savant and and all that and he, he like doesn't want to do it and his buddy who lives um in uh boston with him and it's just kind of this like hardworking uh, construction guy like goes over to him and rather than being kind of maybe like goofy and kind of like, um, you know, brick headed like he usually is, he has this profound moment of reflection where he says, you have a gift that none of us have and that we would kill to have and to get out of the situation that we're in. Don't let that gift be lost. And it's like when we have those moments with people in our lives um where they speak the truth to us it really is the holy spirit speaking through them and telling telling us ex he's telling us exactly what we need to hear absolutely i really appreciate i i gotta let you go now it's been two hours but i really appreciate <laughs> uh meeting you time has flown by yeah it has oh my we'll, goodness we'll definitely talk again and uh, yeah. you, you spoke about friendship and uh to me uh, you're a friend because you know what a friend what is a friend from a Catholic perspective? It's anyone who is sincerely striving to help their brother to get to heaven. That's what friendship is. And I know you don't want me burning in hell. I know that, right? Sure. Obviously. This is like obvious. Now, uh, when you speak with your friends who are or acquaintances who are perhaps uh, don't believe in God or maybe even they're uh, explicit Satanists like I used to be, they can have natural virtues they can love you just like jesus talks about like uh, even the pagans do this right like they love their family and friends and these sorts of things but they don't have that supernatural theological virtues of faith hope and love and that love that that charity that we have towards our brothers and sisters is centered on jesus christ and his church and getting to heaven like that is keep our eyes on the prize we we're created to know God, to love God, and to serve God. So we can be happy with him forever. And that's what friendship's all about. And that's why I'm very confident when I meet someone, I meet a strapping young man like yourself, a recent convert. And uh, I can say from the bottom of my heart, I love you. I wish only the best for you. This is, this is the Christian life. This is how we know that we're Christian. And uh, it's so, it's so, it's so, it's such a broad perspective and such an easy way of being now uh, as compared to when you have identity politics and who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. And uh, when we sincerely love even our enemies, 
it opens up and it gives uh, it opens our heart and it gives us a certain freedom in Jesus Christ that uh, that I didn't have when I was uh, pretending to be God because that's basically what it was when I was running away from God I was pretending to be God myself I was the ultimate judge of what's good what's evil I think that's what the the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil is all about ultimately is that satanic inversion where I'm the judge and I use my private judgment and no one is above me and uh, basically I'm God you know so we have a freedom in Christ and we have a brotherly love in Christ and that's why Christ is king and that's why we need Amen. we don't need a separation of church and state we need Christ the social kingship of Christ Amen. And, and, and Christ is truly King and he needs to be recognized as King by every single nation on the face of this earth. And David, from the bottom of my heart, I love you too. You're my brother in Christ. And I'm thankful that you're my brother in Christ. And I love you very much Thank as you. Christ has loved us. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm overjoyed and humbled that you would even ask me to appear on your show. I, <laughs> I, I'm nobody I'm ashes and dust. And I, you taking time out of your busy schedule to talk to a sinner like me means the world. No, 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 no. It's, it's the complete opposite. I'm thrilled that you talk to me and we can go on like this for hours. So we'll kind of short, Absolutely. We'll kind of but listen, I want to have you back on. I want to talk to you uh, on or off the record and keep, uh, keep uh, my finger on the pulse of your exciting journey to, uh, to sainthood and uh, Saint, pine sap it has a nice ring to it i think it does <laughs> <laughs> so we'll talk very soon remember me and mine in your prayers it's not easy it's not easy in this fallen world my family is really struggling with a lot of brokenness and uh, infighting and s since the very beginning since i came into the, the world and we i need your prayers i need you to pray for me every day even if it's what i do often is i just i ask the mother blessed virgin mary Will you please add pine sap to my implicit prayer list? And occasionally I'll explicitly mention you by name, but at least I ask our Blessed Virgin to put you on that implicit daily intention. And my intention is primarily the true and lasting conversion of all sinners. So that will include you and the relief of the holy souls in purgatory. Those are the sort of the two main things that I focus on all day long, true and lasting conversion and the relief of the holy souls in purgatory. I'm sort of setting the stage just in case I end up in purgatory. It looks like I probably will. But if I if I do end up there, I want to be able to point back and remind God, like, remember all those prayers I did for the souls in purgatory? Yeah, that included me too. So let's, uh, let's get on with it and get me out of here. Absolutely, David. Absolutely. And I, I need to take a key from you to say to our mother, um, hey, can you add David to the implicit prayer list? Because I always, I always forget to say that. So, <laughs> yeah, what, there's what so many want. tips and tricks. We can share all kinds of tips and tricks, including Absolutely. next time. Next time, we're going to talk about the indulgences. I'm sure you know oh, about fantastic. the indulgences. Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. We'll have fun talking about that. All right. Well, take David, good care. Take good care, my brother in Christ. God bless you. God bless you. Love you lots. We'll talk soon. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Let me try and see if I can put my uh, camera up. David, are you? <laughs> David's still there. I don't think he knows how to leave. I'm. Yeah, I'm going to leave right now as soon as I figure out how to leave. <laughs> how do I leave? I think oh, you just you press. Just put, uh, I can uh, shut the window? Yeah, I think so. Okay. <laughs> Bye guys. Thanks Bye. for having me. <laughs> Bye, David. <laughs> All right, hold on. Oh no. It's not shutting. Oh, dude. Oh, there we go. All right, hold on. I gotta see if I can get my um Oh great, it's not gonna let me do it, I don't think. I think I might have hold on, let's see. I'm gonna try it one I'm gonna try it this way. Hold on. Uh video capture device delete. Okay. Let's try this again. Um dude i'm trying to uh put my um okay there we go oh, what the heck why is it not it's not letting me share my uh share my video i might have to we might have to start start a, a new meeting but i'm gonna try it one more time
that's okay. totally fine um or even if you want to leave and you can rejoin this meeting too that might actually work all right let me try that real quick Hold up. Uh, oh by the way chat is my mic good because i'm using a different mic now so let me know if my mic thing is uh my mic volume is okay um All right, let's see. All right. Hey, oh, I can see you, big guy. Nice. All right, Mike <laughs> is good. We are good. No, I didn't. I just did a little uh, hairspray. Oh, We're chilling. Let's go. Um, let me just see. View full screen. Okay, there we go. Yo, you did awesome. That was such a uh, – you're so good, bro. Like, you are such a good uh, speaker and very um, – you know, I don't know. You, even not even just for Catholicism, for America First. Like you are a great representative for the America First movement. How articulate you are and how faithful you are. It's so. Awesome. I'm going to make you a star. I was talking about it in chat. I'm going to be the usher of your Justin Bieber. I'm going to make you blow up. You're going to get on Catholic Answers and all this stuff. And uh, I'm just going to mooch off your success. But um, I heard I heard you uh, you had COVID. Um, how you feeling, buddy? You know, I still got a little bit of a cough and stuff like that. This is actually why. <laughs> you know you're like hey hey brother can we do a show or something i'm like dude i'm in my bed i'm like you know my nose is running my ears were my ears were actually so stuffed up what one night i thought i had to go to the hospital like it felt like i had a double ear infection and it was because my sinuses were so pressurized that it was like blocking out my ears a little bit um but I'm feeling better now. Definitely a lot more chipper for what we're doing. Oh, my goodness. Awesome. So I guess that vax didn't help you, huh? Dude, it didn't help me. It did not help me. And like I said, I I, I am not a I, chill food vax. Do not get it. Please do I was so surprised when you said that. I was yeah. like, oh, we got to record as many episodes as possible before you get mitocarditis or whatever it's called. Seriously, <laughs> seriously. But, hey, I... I'm all against it, man. Let's Good. smash the vax. Awesome. You know. Um, yeah. No, I'm hoping that uh, you know that nothing bad happens to you. you. You said you got it before you converted to Catholicism, right? Uh, I didn't get it before I converted to Catholicism. I got it like shortly after I got COVID because it was kind of like a difficult like professional situation and stuff like that. Um, and I there was like some family pressure and stuff like that. It was. It was not fun, but um, I did not get the booster. Thank goodness. I I axed that. I realized that I I took a massive L, and I was like, no, I'm not. I'm not doing any more. Mm -hmm. No more, man. Yeah. You know. I also think there needs to be a little bit of nuance for people that are so anti-vax. Don't get me wrong. I'm completely anti-vax, oh, and yeah. obviously, but I think people also need to realize that the vast majority of people are normies who aren't as terminally online i guess as we are that know the relevant information and stuff and then also on the other hand you also have to realize that there are people that are being put into a position where it's literally either i could take care of my family or get this vax you know and that Absolutely. if they don't get this vaccination then they're not going to be able to provide for their family and that's a horrible position to be put into and you know um, I don't think we should be super judgmental on the people that choose to do something that is potentially disastrous for their health in order to provide for their family. I think we need to be a little bit more charitable with people like that. But other people who are openly shilling the vax and um, oh, yeah. and, and stuff like that should definitely be condemned and uh, mocked and stuff like that. But I do feel Get like that people will just blatantly say like, oh, you got the vax, you're a, a, a retard and all this stuff when you don't know everybody's personal situation. So. I don't know. But for me personally, I will never, ever get the vax. Uh, I talked about it with actually my interview with the guy that you just did, who is super endearing guy, by the way. He's very, uh, oh, I really like him. Um, and I put, uh, I'll put it, when I upload this to YouTube, I'll put his link to his channel in the description. And I think I put it in the chat and stuff. But um, yeah, he's a really, really nice guy. I like him a lot. We got to get him uh, a little bit more uh, political, I think, and uh, get, get, wean him off his, uh, his boomerisms. But other than that, he's, uh, he's great. Um, yeah, so this is just, uh, this is not going to be like a regular Logos triumphant episode. This is more just, we're going to do some call-ins. I got like, um, I don't know, maybe an hour, an hour and a half. We'll see how it goes. I always say that and then we end up doing like four hours anyway. Um, you're good though, right? You're good for, um, oh yeah, I'm awesome. totally good. I, I had a question. Do you want me to forward this episode, uh, to the group chat and, and tell all the like main AF guys like, Hey, we're doing call-ins and stuff like that. Maybe see if any of them want to like join in or something yeah whatever do it uh, okay yeah, awesome. i'm gonna uh, open the lines um 
Uh, I'm, I didn't I didn't start the group chat yet. I will a second. I do. We do have to get the depressing news out of the way first. Um, I I uh, made a post about this um, yesterday, I believe, because um, uh, I announced a couple of weeks ago that my wife was pregnant, and unfortunately, she did have a miscarriage. Um, and first off, I want to thank everybody who uh, reached out for me. The overwhelming love and support and prayers that I got was very uh, humbling and I was very touched by it. Um, I know you did a, a rosary for me. I, I really appreciate that. Nick Fuentes reached out for me, Dalton Claude Felter, uh, Harris Walker, who we have a, a history of being like at odds with each other and stuff. He even reached out to me. So uh, it, that was very um, humbling. Even the guy, there was a guy in the beginning of the day who was, who we, it basically became a meme in my chat where he was saying, uh, Spexo is bogus Ordo, parentheses, Novus Ordo. He's not traditional. He tries to make <laughs> Michael Lofton uh, be a, uh, uh, act as if he's a good oh he gaslights people into thinking michael lofton is a good apologetics person so we, we've just been like commenting like uh writing that over and over again it's just become a meme in my chat but even he after after that he was literally dunking on me in the in the morning and then when i made that announcement he was like offering prayers for me so i really appreciate oh. that. that that was ve- that was very nice that's of awesome. him that's um, very nice of them. we're still going to make fun of you for that for that quote though that is very <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that is very funny um, that is a copy pasta if i've ever so heard bad. one honestly um <laughs> But yeah, so uh, I wasn't going to make this public. Um, like I, I, I don't know. There, there seems to be like a, a misconception about me a little bit that like I'm like a clout chaser and stuff like that. I'm literally the opposite. I just like literally just say what I believe, and if you like me, you do. It, you, that's awesome. If not, I really don't care. I'm not really trying to look for attention. But um, I don't really share my personal life at all. Uh, I try to keep as much as I can private. But uh, with the pregnancy, like it, it, stupidly, it wasn't even something that. I even fathom the possibility of it not working out because the previous two pregnancies, as soon as we found out that she was pregnant, we announced it to everybody and everything was completely fine. So it wasn't even like a thought in my head that, oh, this could possibly happen. And it was, re- it really sucked because we announced it to our family and, um, you know, we, we kind of knew something was wrong because, uh, like a week after we found out she was pregnant, she started like bleeding or whatever. And like, we were Googling what these symptoms were, were, and they said that spotting in the first trimester is normal, but if it continues to bleed and like whatever, then you need to go to a doctor. We went to the doctor. They did like an ultrasound. They said that there was a line that said that that's an indication that there is a pregnancy, but we can't tell if it's a miscarriage or what's going on. You have to wait a little longer, but they took a bunch of blood tests and stuff. So we were a little bit prepared for like you know, that we kind of thought it was a miscarriage because she was bleeding, but like we, I was still praying for the best and hoping that she was, that it was still going to be a successful pregnancy. And then we got the confirmation and, um, it, no no other way to put it. It sucked like really bad. Um, and, uh, but that's why I had to announce it because I put myself in a position where I announced the pregnancy and now like, I can't not tell people, you know? Um, but it wasn't something like looking for attention or anything like that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. It was just, it, it really sucked. And, and my wife was like handling it way better than I was, you know, like I was literally like crying and like really upset about it and stuff. And she was like, you know, it's okay. Uh, you know, we'll try again and stuff like that. And I'm like, how are you not more upset about this? It was growing in your, in your stomach or whatever and stuff like that. And then she was like, she was like, I am upset about it, but it's God's will. We'll try again. You know, it's, it's his plan and she's correct or whatever. But like, I, I, like I do this all the time and it's something I struggle with. It's like, if somebody isn't as like, um, obsessed or like uh emotional about something that i am like i get mad at them for not like feeling the same way as me you know but i gotta realize people in my chat actually helped me with this that like people handle things differently this woman in my chat was telling me how i guess she had a miscarriage or something and like it didn't really hit her until the due date and then she started crying and stuff like that but um yeah no it was it was uh it was really hard and people were like, oh, well, it's good that it happened now and not when it was more developed. It was only two months. At least it wasn't six months and stuff like that. And I was like, I mean, I get that, but like it was still a person. It was still uh, like they still had a soul, you know, and um, like people say that like when the woman gets pregnant, the father doesn't love the child really and realize that their father until the baby is born. And I completely disagree with that 100 percent because she she got the pregnancy test and there was the little line indicating that the hormones were there that she was pregnant and uh we were like all right let's take another one to make sure we took another one that had the line and i was like wait we got to get the clear blue one that just says pregnant or not pregnant we got two of those they both said that she was pregnant and as soon as i was like sure that she was pregnant like i fell in love like that's my that's my my baby you know and like i was like petting her stomach and telling the baby i loved it and stuff like that so like 
I think that's complete fabrication. Like I, I, even though I never met, met the baby, we were prepared for it. I believe that like I was going to have my third child and I was super excited about it. And it was very, very sad and devastating that the pregnancy was not, um, you know, successful. And, uh, I don't want to get, <laughs> I'm trying not to get emotional or whatever, but it does suck. And I appreciate everybody's prayers and stuff like that. And, um, you know, my wife is right though. It is God's will. And, uh, all that stuff, but it does, it does suck. But, uh, thank you everybody who reached out to me and, um, I'm definitely not going to, uh, announce the next pregnancy, uh, right away because, um, I'm going to wait until it's at least five or six months or something into it because I don't want this to happen again. And we had to, it was, it sucked so bad too. Cause we had to, everybody was so excited that we were having another baby. We literally just finished renovating the new house, right? We, we weren't planning on getting pregnant until February so that it would line up with our daughters going into school. And she got pregnant. As soon as we like finished renovating the house, we, st we created a whole new room and stuff. And, um, you know, they were like, uh, like it, it was every, it was like, oh wow, this is like God's plan because we literally just finished and now they're going to have their own room and all this stuff or whatever. And we told our whole family and her mom was like super excited. And when we told her that she had a miscarriage, she was like heartbroken and devastating and hyster hysterical crying. So it really sucked. Not a fun experience. Um, but like I said, it's God's will. And, uh, but that's it. That's all I'll really say about it. I appreciate, um, everybody reaching out and thank you. Um, I don't want to make this like a depressing, sad episode about anything or whatever, but I did have to address that. So, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And, yeah. and I, the moment I heard that I was heartbroken. Um, you know, I, I was, I was having like, just like a good afternoon hanging out in my bed, you know, being sick and like watching some John Tron. Um, and I, I heard that news and I, I like my phone, my phone fell on the bat and I was, I was blown away. I'm, I'm unbelievably sorry, Spexo, but I, I, I'm not God. Um, but I have very little doubt in my mind that your, your baby is resting with our Lord right now. You know, thank you, man. Appreciate Un unbelievable. That. Appreciate that. Um, all right. So, oh, actually, I wrote some uh, some notes down from your interview. Um, oh, some notes down. OK, no, awesome. it's, it's, it's like just one question, actually, because yeah. you said you said something that I wanted to cl clear up. So you said uh, you said basically paraphrasing that you're either Catholic or not. You're either with the church or you're not. And um, uh, so would you say that, like, these recognize and resist people? And uh, all these other tra rad trad cats who like talk bad about the Pope and stuff like that, who are acting in open disobedience to uh, to the church, are really not Catholic. Yeah, nice. I would. <laughs> and I know that's strong. Um, I know that a lot of people are going to hear that, and they're like, you know, I I got called the other day an apologist for evil because I uh, defended the Pope, and I I went off on a dude in my chat and stuff like that who like started saying you have an ego and you're prideful and and you know what he's right i do i do have an ego and i am prideful and i'm a, I'm a fallen broken man um but the fact is is that his heart was so vexed against the faith and it's like these people they've i, I mean i don't even want to say they're separating themselves they've separated themselves the moment you start attacking the bride of christ it's like it doesn't even it doesn't even matter. I mean, I've I've been in the some of these SSPX group chats where they're like, I'm glad, you know, the Diocese of Chicago is bankrupt, you know. Um, you know, snooze you lose or something like that. You know, this like this gallivanting about like essentially the church like going through her passion. And I'm like, are you even Catholic at that point? Are you even Catholic if like that's awesome to you and that's super cool and stuff like that? No, you're not. Yeah. Like you've chosen to take this path. And I I've said this again and again. I don't care if people call this an ad hominem. They are literally like the old, like the old Catholic movement yeah. that rejected Vatican I. They're literally Ignaz von Dollinger. Like I've read his I I've I <clears throat> I read the book that like was written against him by Cardinal Hergenrother. And like all the things they engage in are literally the same thing that he did literally to the T it's kind of crazy. Yeah. All right. You want to join the, uh, 
the live chat. Oh, yeah. we'll, start, we'll start taking some calls. Yeah, totally. I'll join that. Well, it depends um, how many people join. So far, we got four people in here, but uh, I guess we'll do go by raise hand. I'm sure Static wants to say something. He always wants to say something. <laughs> Static, do you want to say something? Raise your hand if you want to say something. Oh, let me oh, let me mute myself and then mute you. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> All right, we'll we'll bring we'll bring uh, uh let just speak so I can see if it works. Pine up. Nope. Uh, I think I gotta unmute you. I guess. Oh, you gotta unmute yourself on Telegram. Can you hear me? Yep. All good. All right. Let's uh let's awesome. bring in awesome. let's bring in static. Oh, uh, if you want to call in, it's t.me slash spexo. It's in the cozy chat. <clears throat> um, thank you, Groiper George George for uh posting that. All right, we'll allow static to speak. What's up, static? Hello, hello. What is going on, everyone? What's up, buddy? How are you? Good, man. I just want to say, Spexo, I am very sorry for what happened a couple of days ago. I'm also very happy that you and your wife are handling it the best way possible. And it does suck, but, you know, like, uh, like your wife said, it's God's plan. We'll try again and see what happens next. Yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate that, buddy. But um, I wanted to ask it. This is completely unrelated to what the interview was. Um, what's your guys' t- what's your guys' official take on the whole Texas uh, fuck up, as you could say it? With the with the mass shooting. Yeah, the mass shooting. The whole screw up about you know how it took the cops forty minutes to get inside and all that other stuff. What's your guys' take on it? I can go on a whole political rant about psyops and stuff, yeah. but I'll let Pinesap uh, answer first. Um. So, is it confirmed that the shooter was a troon? Which, which the one? No, you're not, we're not talking about the white supremacist one. We're talking about the Mexican tranny, right? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. the Mexican tranny one was like he liked uh, uh, little. Po- he's a pony bro. What is it called? Brony or whatever. My little pony. Um, and he was apparently in like a Discord server with the white supremacist uh, shooter and a bunch of FBI agents who were like egging him on and teaching him about like uh, like guns and tactical gear and things of that nature. Um, so whether or not it was a complete government like funded psyop or anything like that, it, it, they were at least involved. So. Um, yeah, it is confirmed that he was like a cross-dressing weirdo, and he was like, um, he admitted that he was he was planning on shooting up a school when he turned eighteen or something, and he went into like a mental hospital and then was let out, and they said he was fine or something. That's absolutely disgusting. I mean, those are the kind of people that like there's just complete like darkness behind their eyes and stuff like that, and you know, I mean, to be, I'll I'll, I'll have a little bit of a go off. This is this is what sodomy does. It just completely clouds your mind and makes you evil. Like, you know, uh, troons and stuff like that are always like pedophiles and like sexual deviants and perverts and killers and stuff like that. And it's like he is a clear manifestation of like what sodomy and and the sin that literally burned an entire city does. You know, that's all I got to say about that. Yeah, <clears throat> I'll yeah. say. I'll say regarding both uh, shootings, obviously the first shooting with the white supremacist guy and his manifesto being like 63% copy and pasted from the Christchurch shooting. Um, I, I Every time I see a mass shooting or any type of tragedy or anything like that, I immediately think that it's some type of government psyop. I think that it's a false flag and there's a, another nefarious agenda behind it with these institutions either actively taking part in it or at least perpetuating it. Um, Obviously, any loss of life for whatever reason is tragic, especially when it involves children. That's absolutely horrible and heartbreaking and all that stuff. But you also have to remember that, you know, all of these like talking heads and all these people that make us talk about whatever they want us to talk about that's going on in the news. There's tragedies every single day and they purposely pick and choose which tragedies they sensationalize so that they can push an agenda when the mass shooter is white they blame white supremacy when the mass shooter isn't white they talk about gun control so it is always they always use a tragedy to perpetuate some sort of agenda whatever it is and (laughs) including the the white supremacist uh thing whether it was a complete fed op or it was completely natural is irrelevant because these wignats who uh, talk about violence and government overtake and stuff like that. They're doing the same exact thing that the government wants them to do. So whether it was planned by the government or not, it's still having the same result. And the result is they're going to talk about stricter gun rules. They're going to um, associate anybody who's talking about any type of 
uh, white racial identity um, with these complete terrorists and things of that nature. So they're basically doing the government's work for them. You know, people that advocate for violence, that's why they call it Fed posting. They call it Fed posting because that's what Feds do. They go into these chat rooms and they go into these places and they try to get gullible, disenfranchised, mentally ill young people to try to commit acts of violence so that they can use it to perpetuate their agenda. So whether or not it was a Fed op is ultimately um, irrelevant completely. Um, that being said, the whole gun control uh, debate and stuff like that, I, I posted this this morning at like five o'clock in the morning. I woke up and just like had this thought about uh, gun control is that I'm not fundamentally in favor of gun rights. I look at it like freedom of speech, where it is a means to an end. Um, because we live in this multicultural cesspit of a country, not even multicultural in terms of race and stuff like that. I'm talking about everything, different races, different cultures, different religions, uh, different ideologies, all of that stuff put into this so-called melting pot. It's not a melting pot. It, it, we are a geographical landmass of strangers who hate each other. And when you have that, it inevitably causes conflict. And when you have that, there is always going to be violence. There is always going to be this type of stuff. If somebody has the will to do violence, they're going to commit it. And gun laws obviously are not going to affect anybody except for law-abiding citizens. So while we're living in this multiracial hellhole, we, I think every citizen should be uh, have access to guns in order to defend themselves and their and their families. Now, obviously, in my utopia, only male Catholic gun, um, landowners would <laughs> own guns, but that's not a possibility right now. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think that the whole thing, it sucks. Uh, there's always going to be tragedies, but it's just, it, it's the same thing that they, they spark up some news, you know, that we care about for like a month and then it's over with and they move on to the next thing. And I was at work and I don't engage in politics or any type of like, like a uh, serious discussion with people at work. I've learned my lesson. Um, but the conversation I was hearing was absolutely insane. This one guy was like, I have children that are in school and you know what? People shouldn't be allowed to go into a school and just shoot a bunch of children. Like, oh, really? You think that murdering children should be illegal? Wow, so true. Why didn't anybody think of that? And then the other person was like, no, what we need is more background checks and we need to put x-rays in every school and uh, put everybody put their backpacks through x-ray scanners and stuff like that. And it's like, you're both, this is why democracy is, is nonsense. This is why neither of you should be able to vote or have any type of decision making because you both have zero idea yeah. what you're talking about. And the other take that I had, and this is the fundamental take that boils down to everything, it is not about white supremacy it is not about gun control. It is not about any of that. The fundamental problem of why this keeps happening is lack of Catholicism, because in a Catholic society, this does not happen. OK, and so I, I put that on, on uh, Instagram and somebody was like, oh, what about Mexico and Brazil? They're the most Catholic countries in the world and they're they're not. Uh, they're the most violent countries in the world, too. So I guess Catholicism doesn't do that. That's not what I'm talking about. Just because you're culturally Catholic or you have people that are claiming to be Catholic, they're kinos, Catholic in name only, doesn't make a Catholic country. When I talk about a Catholic country, I'm talking about a Catholic government regime, Catholic social order and Catholic morality being implemented through the systems of law. That's what I'm talking about. And when you have that, which we are very far away from having, that's why we try to push the temporal affairs towards that. But when you have that, you to completely get rid of all of this nonsensical violence and conflict that arises from a multicultural country like we have. Anyway, <laughs> that's my take. <laughs> nice. But it just boils, it boils down to 19 kids are dead because the cops failed to do their job. That's just the bottom line. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't and, care. And somebody was posting memes like the back, the blue boomers are going to be like, I don't care if my children have to die if it means protecting blue lives. Like, the, like, when are people going to learn that the cops are, as long as they are extensions of our corrupt government who hates us, that they are not our friends and they do not deserve our support? Absolutely. Very true. Yeah. All right. Uh, All right. Thank you for calling in static. There's uh, we got a couple of other people that want to yeah. talk. So, uh, you know, maybe hey, we'll bring King gotcha. Laffy next. Yeah, let's go King Laffy. <laughs> uh, King Laffy, you are allowed to talk. Hey, Spexo, what up? Hey, man, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, man. I just wanted to say, like, uh, I love you, dude, and thanks for the post. Um, love you too, brother. You. Thank you. And that that's really it. I, didn't, I don't have much to say. I just want to say, I love I you, man. I love you too. Are you British? No, I'm from Texas. What? Uh, okay, I thought you, I thought I sensed a little oh. British accent for a second. Awesome, Texas represent. Nah. Awesome, All bro. Right. Take care, dude. Take care. Thank you. Nice guy. 
All right, uh, Pace, let's go. He's awesome. He called me brother today, and I was like, that is so sweet, man. <laughs> I actually got off on the wrong foot with King Laffy a while ago, and then uh, then we made uh, we, we uh, made amends to each other or whatever. So, yeah, he's a good guy. Uh, awesome. Pace, what's up, buddy? Hey, man, I, I'm absolutely bewildered to be talking to you right now. You have no idea how uh, <laughs> great the honor is on my behalf. Oh, honor is mine, brother. So, I mean, how, how have you been? Well, okay, I won't ask that. Maybe that's not a great question. Uh, well, did you uh, see the Nick clip uh, the other day where he was uh, playing with his bottle cap, putting yeah. it in his eye? <laughs> yes, the Dan Crenshaw. I posted that, yeah. The Dan Crenshaw thing. That was great. Holy <laughs> That was fantastic. I... <laughs> I'm Dan <Wait>. Crenshaw. <laughs> You need to die for I'm Israel, to, matey. I'm trying to do it with my confirmation ring, but it's not going to fit in my eye. <laughs> oh, wait. Oh, I did want to... Oh, Specs, are you okay if I do this real quick? I wanted to imitate your post real quick that you Let's posted. Once you receive the Eucharist, dude, you realize... <laughs> <laughs> Once you lovingly accept Jesus Christ, you realize that you you've been realize. working for... <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome <laughs> yeah that was a great clip honestly i i saw that and like that is such a like nick um golden archive clip right there uh i i'm trying to remember the last one that he had that i was like just had me laughing he always has like some good moment um but like that one really hit it home for me. I, I I looked at that and like the face he made and stuff like that, and just kept on saying, "Look, everybody, I'm I'm Dan I'm Dan Crenshaw I'm Dan Crenshaw," and he's just going off. That was that was gold, man. My my favorite thing that Nick does, and everybody hates this, but I think it's so funny. It's when he does like a bit like that, right? But like he keeps going until after it stops being funny, and the whole chat is like, "All right, we get it, we get it," and he just keeps going on. Like he did it with the uh, the Wayne Gang thing. <laughs> where he was like talking about Wayne gang, right? And he did it for literally like 15 minutes straight, just repeating the same joke over and over again. And I couldn't stop laughing because of how mad the chat was getting. That, that is the best part of the show. Mm -hmm. Every single time that yeah. happens. <laughs> he really, he, he's like, a, I mean, I don't, I'm not trying to like act like a simp for Nick, but he really is just hilarious naturally. Like he just has this natural oh, yeah. ability to just like go on these like random 15 minute bits that are just like golden. Well, I mean, it's why, like, he went on, on Sam Hyde's show and just, like, integrated so well in, like, mm -hmm. the Andy Kaufman-esque, like, post-ironic humor. Yeah. And literally yeah. now people just post on the internet a word that starts with Ed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> over and over and over yeah, you're, you're actually the first person that I've met besides myself that has associated Sam Hyde with Andy Kaufman. I was, I'm a huge fan of Andy Kaufman's humor and stuff. That's why I think I like Sam Hyde so much is because just like, I like that the standups that he did that he does where like the audience it's not meant for the audience it's meant for like the viewers at home where he's trying to like get the audience mad and make them like feel uncomfortable but it's funny for us it's just so good that's awesome <laughs> did you guys catch uh that one video of nick reacting to the mtv documentary that they did of him a few years back i think i watched that live i don't really remember it too well though oh man i there was this one clip from it. Uh, he was at that. I I don't know if you remember this part, but he was at the uh, anti-gun protest, and he oh, walks yeah. up to some guy. <laughs> yeah, okay, I remember. Uh, and he tries to talk to him. Yeah, um, and the guy's like, "I don't really think I want to talk to you." And Nick goes, "Why?" And the guy goes, "Because of that hat." And Nick goes, "Oh, you're a faggot, dude." Yeah, yeah. And they just him a faggot. <laughs> Yo, that's actually another thing of Nick because I've met uh, like there's a lot of people that I've met that like they'll talk big on the internet, but then when you meet them in person, also I'm six five and awesome, but like when you meet them in person, they just talk, oh, you know. But Nick is actually exactly how he is in person. Like like if he doesn't like you or whatever, he'll just say whatever he wants to your face, and I I, I respect that. He's not like a keyboard warrior, you know. He's I admire that. Yeah. And then there was the neo Nazi that was like. Dude, when are you gonna quit yep. these games? No, there was there was this yo the, the, when the the reform neo Nazi or whatever he was watching the clip of Nick and Nick was like was like they hate white people. It's clear they are they have an agenda against white people. And his face was just like <gasps> like he couldn't believe like he was saying he was like you're saying the same things that we were saying and stuff. And he's like yeah, but you're, you're 
<laughs> oh my gosh, dude. Right. It's so oh. funny, dude. I um, it kind of reminds me. I, I I hope you're okay if I bring this up, Spexo. So. Mm-hmm. Remember when CWC showed up as LA Noir to oh, the one dude. pro life protest, and Beardson like called him out like right there too. Like that same confrontational thing. That was so bro funny. like. Me and Beardson are completely cool now. Like, I have no animosity towards him. But I will say that for CWC to allow that to happen was so bad. Like, it was just so bad that he did not, like, even try to get confrontational or whatever. If somebody was calling me a, 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 the F word for homosexual, because we can't say that anymore, right? Uh, if somebody was saying that to my face or whatever, they're getting punched in the face. Or they're, they're, I'm getting in their face and it's going to be a conf- confrontational. You know what I'm saying? Like, for him to just be like, ha and just, like, whimper away like that, that was such a bad look, dude. Like, I mean, I understand that there was, like, other groipers around and stuff like that. But, dude, like, be a man, bro. Defend yourself. Like, what are you doing? Beardson made him look like such a little bitch, bro. Oh, yeah. It Well, it was like... um. It was the documentary all over again <laughs> when um what's what's the guy's name again who shot the documentary about about all the groipers Louis Thoreau like at the British Louis Thoreau thank that, you that, Sorry, that made totally me forgot. that made me an international movie star by the way <laughs> oh yeah I remember seeing you in that yeah. movie sixty pounds actually, heavier my, Spexo appearance my buddy was talking about actually seeing you being filmed for that movie and talking to like Bro, talking to Louis Thoreau. Everybody was spurging out on me. I'm so glad like <laughs> I talked about this already, but I'm so glad that like they didn't they could have made me look way worse. You know, I only I was only in it for like 10 seconds or whatever, but they could have made me look so worse. And I was nervous because everybody when I was doing that interview was spurging out. And for that reason I will never talk to <laughs> another interviewer uh, on camera again like that. Like that is not s- explicitly associated with like America First or like something else, you know, because I was completely under the impression that it was like all coordinated with America first and stuff. And uh, then after I did the interview, people were like, why would you talk to a reporter and blah, blah. I was like, I thought that like it was all cool, you know, but I'm glad that I didn't look too spur. I looked like I had Asperger's because I was looking around like a psychopath and stuff. But I I think I came (laughs) off way better than I could because I don't know this. Actually, a lot of people didn't see this video because it got deleted from YouTube for copyright infringement. But I, I actually did a video where I went over my appearance on that documentary and like, first of all, he, he interviewed me for like 25 to 40 minutes, something like that. Like he interviewed me for a really long time. And the majority of the interview was about me denying the authenticity of the Helen Keller story, <laughs> which was just so like random. It wasn't even about America first or anything like that. Right. But he did ask me about uh, Nick Fuentes being a Holocaust denier. Right. And I said, um, he's not a Holocaust denier. He's a, he's uh, you know, he was making a joke. And, you know, whatever you could, uh, you could make, uh, you, you should be able to make jokes about whatever you want and people like pick and choose what is acceptable to joke about or whatever, something like that. But after they told me that like it wasn't in association with America first, he could have totally spliced my clips up to go from like him asking me about the Holocaust to like then cutting it to my answer about Helen Keller and being like, oh, so what do you think about the Holocaust? And then it cuts to my answer of Helen Keller and it's like, oh, totally fake story. Didn't happen. <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, ah, <laughs> but that didn't happen, so I'm glad that didn't happen. Um, <laughs> um, Helen Keller, I've brought that up to like probably a hundred people, and I've started to. The gears are turning. I can see it in their faces every time I bring it up. Helen Keller is is, is so is so fake and, and you know what's funny when Nick was doing that whole meme thing like everybody thought it was like a joke but that was like one of the first like conspiracy theories that I learned about like before like politics and stuff like that it was like dinosaurs being fake and then probably Martin Luther being a communist and then Helen Keller like it was like those three things and so when people when it started getting popular I was like oh I know all about this and I actually made a video that went semi-viral uh, Vincent James retweeted it and got 30,000 likes uh, um, views or whatever and then when I went to AFPAC 2, that's why they interviewed me because they saw my uh, video on Helen Keller. <laughs> I didn't even realize that. But yeah, it's the whole Helen Keller thing is complete, complete nonsense. I got to show yeah. my, my sister your video on Helen Keller because she actually like red pilled me on that. She's like, there's no way. She's like, Helen Keller faked everything. She was like, and, and, and she red pilled me on it when she was like, dude, she, it said that she flew a plane. I'm yeah. like, no. Yeah. 
literally no. Yeah, no. She, she just happened I'm, to have all the same exact political beliefs that her handler did and stuff like that. She was deaf and blind. She yeah. went de she went deaf, dumb, and blind at 18 months old. The CDC's prognosis for anybody who goes deaf, dumb, and blind that young is that they will never live a normal life. They will never be able to function in society. They will never be able to have a cognizant like thought or anything like that. They may be able to like regurgitate certain things or like be a, some type of parrot or whatever, but they expect us to believe that this lady was just magically able to understand society and complex political systems and all of this stuff by being able to like feel certain shapes and or whatever. And you look at her speeches where Ann Sullivan or whatever, where she's like putting her hand in, uh, Helen Keller's putting her hand in Ann Sullivan's hand and she's doing like this or whatever. And Ann Sullivan is just speaking completely normally or whatever. You're going to tell me that wasn't a pre-recorded scripted thing. It's so <laughs> fake and gay. I mean, hey, Helen yeah. Keller, girl boss, right there. So. Yeah, uh, fe feminist icon. Yeah, I remember I, I posted that, and this handy, this guy from Antifa, who's like popular on Instagram, wh who's in a wheelchair, was like mocking me for it or whatever. And he was, and he was like making a bunch of posts about how like I'm an alt right troll who denies Helen Keller or whatever. And I just kept sending him pictures of his own face, <laughs> and then he blocked me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, good times, good times. <laughs> Uh, all right, man. Uh, we're gonna take some other calls if you don't mind. Unless you had something, you had something else yeah, to ask. Sorry, I, I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to uh, take over here. But I mean, yeah. Hey, oh, thanks dude, for having me on, man. I really appreciate talking to you. Awesome, bro. God bless. See you soon. Yeah, yeah brother. God bless to you. Pray for you both. Thank you very much. Absolutely. All right. Uh, who, who do you want to take in next? I'll let you choose. Um. Let me see here. I, I need to look at the roster. We got. Oh, Pete. can we? Uh, yeah, can we select P-Head? He uh, entered my chat the other day. I, I wanted to talk to him. Sure, let's take Okay, P-Head. What's up, buddy? You got to Okay. Hello? Hey, man. Hi. Hey. What's going on? Not much, just chilling. All right. Do you have uh, a question or a topic you wanted to discuss? Uh, yeah, I got one. Um, do you know if, um, does the church have a stance on pir online piracy, anything like that? Oh, that's actually a really good question. Um, uh, Spexo, do you, is there anything you want to contribute or do you want me to handle this one? I'm sure you know more than me, but I think that would still kind of fall under stealing, but I don't know. It, so yes, it would. And basically what the church says about piracy is that it's it's um you know it's a sin it's um it's a it it's definitely a sin uh, to the degree at which you pirate like i think if you like pirate like kung fu panda one you're not gonna you know you're not gonna burn in hell for all eternity yeah but that's, what about what about the sequel like, what about the sequel the sequel is a dull story oh dude two <laughs> two don't pirate don't one. pirate don't pirate that one don't pirate two mortal yeah, sin pay full price but yeah for I, <laughs> I would say that that would um uh, cross into the threshold of sin. Um, and this is something that I've struggled with a lot. I, you know, do a ton of reading and I, sometimes it's just easier to download a copy of a book or whatever. Um, but it's definitely one to avoid just cause we don't want even the near occasions of sin. So overall it is sinful. I've heard there's sometimes situations where it's kind of more of a gray area. Like for instance, if a book's out of print, right. And you can't buy it that might not be that might be sinful or maybe might not be sinful because at that point it's like are you really stealing anything you know this book's been long out of print and stuff like that so that one you can maybe feel a little bit more reassurance but it's like if it's like a new book or like a new movie or even like a movie you could like readily buy that came out i would say um uh, definitely avoid that how about the oh also just to add that i think that if you if you, like let's say you own a dvd and you want to download a digital version of it, you've already paid for the the media. So I think that downloading the digital version wouldn't really necessarily be oh. stealing. Also, um, somebody made a good point. What about Netflix, uh, like account sharing or stealing? Considering that Netflix is a tool of the devil and produces, uh, you know, Satanistic propaganda, I, I don't know. What, what would you say about that? That I I would err on. That's like so slight. I I don't even think that would be like venially sinful, honestly. I mean, you know, it's like you're sharing an account or whatever. It's probably fine. I don't think. 
I don't even think that's like venially sinful to be completely honest. We need Vatican three. The the main point of Vatican three is to be uh, addressing D- DMCA uh, claims and and what the proper yes. magisterial uh, <laughs> things are on that. Uh, all right, P head. Any other questions or? Uh, no, it's all right. I just want to say, um, you guys are really cool. Like, I love your videos. Thanks, man. Awesome. Appreciate that. We love you, too. Have a great day. God bless you. All right. See ya. See ya. All right. Uh, who do you want next? Super Heavy Booster or Byzantine Byzantine? Oh, dude. Um, can we get Super Heavy in here? He's my boy. Let's do it. Oh, wow. See that Byzantine? He's choosing Super Heavy over you. All right. Super Heavy, what's up? Hey, guys. Hey, man. Um, I just wanted to say thanks for uh, specs of like thanks for starting this Catholic AF AF movement like um, and then YouTube Pinesap for your chat like I don't know I've I've just met so many great people and it's uh, it's it's been a really nice community thanks, but um, what I, what I wanted to talk about is I, I just wanted to share my experience, uh, my experience of what happened when I watched. Um, the mass of the ages episode two mm. it was uh it was kind of frustrating um so i, uh, I worked from home and i was able to essentially just block off that hour of my day so that um i could watch uninterrupted when it came out i was really really looking forward to watching it and uh my mother-in-law was also here watching our little baby and um i was like uh yeah, she, she, she's not Catholic, kind of, kind of got away from the faith. But I'm like trying to get her back into it, and so we watched it. And uh, hold on, yeah, I heard bad things about the second episode. I heard the first episode was really good, but the the second uh, the second episode was kind of uh, cringe. Yeah, I honestly, after it was done. I had like to think about it for a moment and I think I was a little light on my review. I'm going to kind of rework it. I didn't like it. I I think it was negative. I think it was typical, you know, the tired old drum of Bunini, 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 Freemason. And he's lying to this person. He's lying to that person as if like he was the only guy working at the concilium, right? Handling the liturgy, you know? Yeah. It's like, it's just, I, I really think, I mean, I'm still studying the whole story, the liturgy. That's the one thing of Vatican II I need to study quite a bit more. But as Michael Lofton and, and, and River Run have talked about, a lot of this is just like such conspiracy gobbledygook. It's not like, you know, as cut and dry as as documentaries like this like to make it. And, you know, I was talking to uh, my good friend Sean today on on. Uh, on telegram and he made a good point what they're they're unintentionally doing is they're not adding to the beauty of the latin mass they're just making people hate the novus ordo and it's like it, it, it's it's such a self-defeating purpose it's like look the mass of the ages should just be about loving the tlm it doesn't need like i don't need to love the tlm and then crap on the novus ordo it's like yeah i, I just love the tlm you know, so that's essentially well, what what happened at my, you know, kind of ignorant mother-in-law who I'm trying to get back to the faith watches this thing and is like, "Oh my god, that's so horrible." Oh so god, essentially my whole life the mass has just been like invalid and and all of Vatican II is like invalid and the church is just completely infiltrated and broken. And that's and the so problem. She, that's the problem we talk about all the time. She walked away from that movie less interested in Catholicism. Yeah, that's the problem we talk about all the time, where, where everybody talks about how, like, oh, why are you just going after these rad trads and not these liberals and stuff like that? And it's like, we do. We do we do go after the, the liberals, of course, but the rad trads aren't exempt oh, really? from criticism, and it's things like, of that nature where they're leading people into error, and they're leading people away from the faith because they're, you know, giving these perspectives that are just not in line with church teaching. Saying, like, it's completely fine to have the... Um, preference that you prefer the TLM. I, I do. I do too. I think the TLM is uh, superior in every single way to the Novus Ordo. Um, I attend a Novus Ordo regularly, but uh, I would obviously prefer if there was a TLM closer to me that I would go every single uh, chance I got. You know, but that doesn't invalidate the Novus Ordo just because you like it better. You know, and um, like I heard that the first episode of uh, the uh, Mass of the Ages, which I watched the vast majority of, um, 
that they were basically just talking about the beauty of the of the mass and going through the, uh, the the steps of it and what they do and what each thing means. And I heard that it was really great, and that's why everybody was so excited for the second nice. episode. And I heard the second episode was, like you said, just basically not really talking about the mass itself, but just going against the uh, alternative masses or the Novus Ordo specifically and talking about, like you said, all these conspiracy theories, which is just, it's just not helpful. It's not, it's not, w- what are you trying to do? Are you trying to bring people to the faith or are you trying to uh, push people away? Yeah, and there sh- at the very least should have been some some disclaimer at the end of like some archbishop or some cardinal being like someone with authority saying, okay, Vatican's two was still very valid and the current mass is still very valid and here are all the reasons why but it's it was um i don't know man it, it was uh it was frustrating <laughs> for me yeah. uh yes, uh, so to have that experience because like who, i'm just like you guys who I produced that like what where where's this from cameron o'hearn i'm pretty sure is his name and if you go on the website um latin mass look in their recommended books um mo- good good percentage of the recommended books are uh sspx and it's like the bad ones crisis magazine uh, yeah and, yep. and crisis magazine has some good articles here and there but like if like i feel Eric like Sam is really if, if your whole if your whole thing if, if you're a con, uh, catholic content creator for lack of a better word if you're if your main hobby or job for these people is producing Catholic content and the vast majority of what you're doing isn't trying to bring people to the faith but try to give your rad trad perspective on why there's a crisis in the church and all these bad things that happen then I feel like you're, you're I mean obviously I don't know anybody's heart but I feel like your intentions aren't truly genuine in trying to bring people to Jesus Christ you're just trying to bring people to your uh, personal interpretation of what is the correct way which holds no validity in, in terms of the church I think so too. And I think, I think we really are living through the time of like the remnant where it's like, we have to be the one group of Catholics that doesn't go, doesn't steer that way because these, these people, what they're going to do is I, and, and you probably know this figure Spexo. Do you know Steve Skojek? No. Steve Skojek uh, was the main, like, I think head editor of one Peter five. Okay. He's completely left the faith. He's completely apostasized. I, th- I think I remember that happening on Twitter. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep. And it's all because he, you know, he beat the same old tired drum of Vatican II bad and, you know, St. John the 23rd to Pope Francis is bad and everything written after 1958 is bad and stuff like that. Where is he now? Is he still Catholic? No, he's not. He's, he's functionally an atheist now. Yeah. Um, look at... Uh, Look at Rod Dreher. Rod Dreher um, is Eastern Orthodox now. And that's where, you know, like people, people always say, you know, why do you go so hard on the SSPX? Because literally, if you follow the natural conclusion of their arguments, you're not going to be Catholic. You're going to be Eastern Orthodox. And I don't mean that, like, in a sense, Eastern Orthodox, uh, you know, for all the Orthodox bros listening, I know I'm going to get get your panties in a wad. I, I hate to be blunt. And I'm not talking about Zoomer theosis. I love you, my brother. Con- confirm awesome. that Orthodox people wear panties, by the way, by Pine Sap just now. That all <laughs> Ortho Bros wear panties. <laughs> there are some dress. great Orthodox. I love Zoomer theosis. He's a great man. And there's some others probably in the chat. Joey, my boy Joey, and Pius's Papal Zuavs. I love that guy. But to all these Ortho Bros, you're not the true church. <laughs> the reason I say the reason I say that SSPX people will be led to Eastern Orthodoxy is because of a misinterpretation of what's called the Vincentian canon. So what I actually referenced this during the interview, what's the Vincentian canon? So St. Vincent of Lorenz talks about how, how do we know like authentic teaching and tradition in the life of the church? And his basic rule is it has to be believed at all times in every place by like all like true Catholics, right? That is true. But as Cardinal Hergenrother writes in Anti-Janus, this is against Ignaz von Dullinger, which, as I said before, the SSPX people are like Ignaz von Dullinger. It is not the only rule of tradition. It is one of two. The other rule is the magisterium. And the magisterium confirms that tradition. If you separate that out, it is total anarchy. 
anyone can claim that anything is tradition. You could claim that, I mean, even as a Catholic, you could claim maybe the faith defected when we uh, declared the Immaculate Conception. St. Thomas Aquinas and quite a bit of Thomas didn't believe in the Immaculate, immaculate Conception. Is that is that being held by all Catholics at every at at every place and every time? No, it's contested. So who do we go to? We go to the church. And the problem with Eastern Orthodoxy, and this is the the problem that I, I said to Jeremiah Bannister, is it's not sola scriptura, it's sola tradition. But not in a way of, of valuing tradition, but in a way of privately interpret interpreting what that tradition is. And so when you have that, this is why they have schism upon schism upon schism, why there's the recent schism with the, U the other Ukrainian church leaving Moscow and why Moscow is non communing Constantinople and why the cops crap on the um, Armenians and the Armenians crap on the Greek Orthodox and stuff like that. It's it's total chaos because they privately interpret what tradition is. Still there? <laughs> yeah, I'm still here. I was just uh, listening. All yeah, that. sorry, I had a long-winded rant, brother. <laughs> no, that that was uh, that was great. Um, totally agree. You know, I I, I think uh, I consider myself probably like a lot of other people in this chat, like a glad trad. Based. But it was uh, it was real, <laughs> dude. It was tough <laughs> showing her the documentary, and then her reaction is just she is less interested in Catholicism now thinks it's like, uh, you know, so there was some apostasy at Vatican II and really, really bring bad her, experience from that. Super heavy. Bring her to mass, bring her to your reverent novice ordo mass. I want you yeah. to show her how the faith is lived. Yeah, totally. No, totally agree. But, uh, all right, man. That was Thanks. it. Just wanted to share that with you guys. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks brother. Guys. God bless. Absolutely, brother. God bless you. All right. Let's bring business. We got to straighten Byzantine out, yo, because he's been super sus in chat. We got to, we got to get this guy in here and, and convert been him. Doing a little bit of sus stuff. He's been, he's been sus, sus. post. He's been sus posting. What's up, Byzantine? Um, Byzantine. Listen, I, I, I don't want this hostility coming in. All right. Like, Dude. You got Spexo, like, taking away my Janny position and not letting me put. Um, stickers and gifs of Nick Fuentes humping, like, oh no. Uh, and then you have freaking Pines up over here. Oh, yeah, let's take freaking Peaky Head and Super Heavy Booster over me. <laughs> all right. Let, in in, in my defense, hold up, hold up, hold up. Let's, let's, let's get, let's set the record straight. All right. In my defense, I made you business, I made you a, a Janny because you are very active in my chat and you've had some good conversations. But very recently, first it started off with you saying, oh, I used to uh, remix rap songs and make them about gay sex. Oh, okay. That's something weird to admit in a Catholic group chat. Then you start posting other gay stuff saying, you know, I'm not into trannies, but you know, if I didn't know it was a tranny and you know, it was, it was passing and it was hot, you know, maybe I would do something with it. Um, second strike. Then you keep saying this other sussy weird <laughs> stuff. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm all for irony and whatever. And I get the subversion of expectations or whatever, but dude, there comes a point where it's like, I think that you're legitimately same sex attracted and I got to take the church's position on this. I don't think that same sex attracted people should be bishops. Okay. First of all, when it came to the, <laughs> oh yeah, if, if I couldn't tell yet, I, I, I'd smash. I didn't bring that up. Just. Oh, oh, out of nowhere, someone asked me, okay, I'm an open book. I have autism, <laughs> okay? You freaking, and, and, and second of all, freaking, li listen, freedom of speech, okay, man? Is gay. Freedom, freedom, we, it is not, I am against, you know that I'm against freedom of speech. We hate freedom of speech here. We're on a, we're on a freedom of speech platform, but this channel is not freedom of speech. My, my cozy, my uh, Telegram channel is not freedom of speech. <laughs> Your but we, I, 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 will, I will, I will put you on a. I will uh, after this stream. I will give you your Janny status back, and we will put you on a, a a limited time frame to see how you react. And if you if you can go if you can manage to go a full twenty four hours without sus posting, maybe you'll keep your title. Oh. All right. Oh no, that's gonna be hard, man. Because I remember who that that one guy with the avatar of the of the uh, of the Pepe that's like half blue, half white, and then like the keys of the church are behind him. George. Yeah, George. Yeah, he, <laughs> he put um. So I was uh, <laughs> I was complaining about about my Janny position being taken away and not being able to put stickers and gifs. 
and he was like um he posted a poll uh saying should the peasants be able to put stickers and gifs and he said yes and then no and then the third option was i'm gay <laughs> <laughs> Yo, the sticker thing, like, literally, I didn't even, I don't even know how mods can use stickers. That wasn't even, like, my intention. I don't want anybody using stickers because every time that I've allowed stickers in my chat, I, it's been, like, five times where people will be like, come on, we want stickers, blah, blah. I turn on stickers for literally a couple of minutes, and then I come back to the chat, and it's nothing but duck butts, all right? It's duck, <laughs> duck, duck, just constantly, like, this is this is a serious Catholic hangout, all right? And uh, one, Ducks, uh, so you uh, haven't uh, even seen my uh, chat. Uh, it's uh, all duck booty. Uh, a, duck, a duck butt once in a while is fine. I, I'm a duck butt respecter but just constant duck butts are like come on this is this is not magisterial talker <laughs> First, personally i think my favorite i think my favorite sussy sticker is the one of uh, i think zeta kissing another frog in front of a and then a, a gay flag in the background I think yeah i sucks. still i i this is like the stuff that i'm just because i'm a millennial i guess i just don't understand the appeal of it I, I, i'm in another chat i'm not gonna i don't want to expose and 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 uh you know flex a little bit but uh with with some other content creators and that is literally gets posted every single day and i'm like what is this i don't understand <laughs> like what, is this political what does this mean <laughs> you know here we this go, here we go. all the mods Jackson all the mods here. in my chat are are posting duck butts already let's see if you can see <laughs> 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 Listen, and the riots. They're always talking yeah. about gay sex and stuff yeah, like that. I don't, like, I don't get it. Though. I don't get it. But that's, Dude, that's, that's, that's like an, another thing. Like the, it's another thing. Like the glow gloiper thing. I don't get it. I just roll with it. All right, whatever. <laughs> that's that's what this their thing. Uh, do you not remember the origins of the glow gloiper? No. Yo, okay. Let me tell this story because everybody thought that I was like joking. I, I, this is. I'm not joking. Okay. So the glow gloiper thing happens. I still have no idea what the origin is. You can explain it later if you want. But whatever. Everybody was posting glow gloiper or whatever. I had no idea what it means. So like a year and a half ago, I'm working with this guy and he's like 45 years old or something like that. And he's a total like libertarian Norby type guy. And he's telling me he watches Tucker Carlson and Tim Pool and stuff like that. He's a big online guy or whatever. Right. So I tell him about Nick Fuentes in America first. A couple days later, he comes back and he's like, well, I don't know. I don't really know how I feel about his views on interracial marriage and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, look, you're not going to agree 100% with everything he says, but he's trust me, he's good. America First is a growing movement. It's great. You should really watch his stuff or whatever, right? Now, I don't see him for like a year and a half, okay, because he's working in a different uh, section and different job sites and stuff like that. So then I see him again a year and a half later, right? He comes up to me. He's like, oh, hey, how you doing or whatever, right? We, we don't even talk about politics or anything like that. He's about to leave and he goes, oh, by the way, I just wanted to say, and he comes up to me and he whispers to me, he goes, Glow Kloiper. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> right? So, like, and I was like, that's cool that, I, I mean, <laughs> I understand it's a meme or whatever. I have no idea where that came from or what it is, but awesome that this 45-year-old guy uh, <laughs> just randomly said that to me. <laughs> I heard it was from Truth Social because you couldn't name yourself Groiper, but you could name yourself Gloiper. Oh, is that and it? So that's how it got yeah. into like. A oh, fact. I thought it was before that. No, yeah, I think I think Nick made a Truth Social account and it said Gloiper. Yeah. Gloiper. Uh, gotcha. I, I remember. I do remember Wendy Rogers posting something saying like, "You can't write Gloiper, but you could write Gloiper, right?" It wasn't Truth Social. It was um that other gay one that banned Nick immediately. It was uh, what was that other oh, one? Uh, yeah. Getter, Getter, I think Getter. Oh, get her, yeah. dude. Oh, get her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that, oh, yeah, yeah. That's the one where he made the Gloiper thing. Yeah. Oh, Ooh. okay. It was get her. Sorry, not Truth Social. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because Truth is made. Yeah, it was by Trump. Yeah. You know, speaking of the freaking the oh, Gloiper, <laughs> like, bro, that night where he was where he said he was gonna do that stream on the drama, and then like <laughs> he had that lobby open for like an hour, and I was just taking a long walk, and I was just listening to all this hype rap music, and I was just getting so hyped, and it just ended in that. I I wanted to slash my wrist. I was oh well my gosh. with wait with what Nick uh, doing the uh, the Kanye troll thing where he just danced to the music for like an hour. No, not even, not even the one. It, it was worse. It was the one where there was a like a lot more. It was a it was a long ass lobby. Playing, he was playing. I think he was playing Kanye, Kendrick, some. Uh, what's it called? Who was that dude that got owned by Drake in that rap beef? Uh, Elton John. Drake, I forget his. No, no, no. He's a guy. He's a rapper from Philadelphia. I forget his name. Uh, Meek Mill. Yeah. Uh, so, so I was getting mad hype, and then it ended with the 
<laughs> with the, I baked you a pie. And it's like, oh, my oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I oh actually. Oh boy, what flavor! <laughs> yeah, I actually love that, and I was. I mean, I'm glad that he addressed it and cleared everything up or whatever. But I really was just hoping that he wasn't going to even address it at all and just continue to troll people because there's something. I, maybe this is sinful. Maybe Pine Sap needs to correct me on this, but there's just something. I just get this joy when people are expecting something and they just get totally let down and mad about it, and like they're just completely trolled. Like there's something that just brings me that like mm, feeling, you know. So when he did that with the with the jacket and the Kanye West glasses and stuff like that. Oh, and by the way. Logos, Logos Triumphant fans, we did a whole stream where I was wearing this jacket and the thing the day after it happened, and so was Pine Sap, was and literally nobody knew what we were doing. They were just like, oh, I guess that's what they wear. I guess that's what they wear now, and it was like nobody even understood that it was like a, a, an homage to what Nick did the, literally the night before, and every time I post a clip from that, they're like, why are you wearing those glasses and stuff like that, and and my basement is really hot, all right, so I, I, I literally, oh, yeah. literally sweated for that bit, and nobody got it, so thanks. <laughs> And then I started to get called Rain Man and Terminator yeah. after that. And I was like, I, it made a whole new uh, identity. Spexo. Yo. That just reminded me of something. Dark Sap. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Some, uh, Dark Sap character we got, art. We got two stickers we're going to add hopefully tonight that uh, I think Frederick made. And then just tonight, even more based, who is in the chat, I think. We'll get to him uh, next i think but uh he, they made uh two dark sap stickers that we're gonna add to the sticker pack by the way my cozy chat has the best stickers by far by the way oh yeah oh definitely <laughs> all right uh all business right. team we're gonna we're gonna take another caller now is that oh, cool can i just say one more thing sure man uh i just gotta say um if you remember when nick was talking about uh what's it called the maricopa county and he said oh wow the government investigated the government they said that, that they were totally a-okay in the debate with destiny yeah yeah yeah, and I just thought of what you said today, how you're the, I think, I forgot, the muglet Christian that takes everything that the, the magisterium says by blind faith. Oh, like, the, the, grug, the, grug brain, the grug the uh, grug brand Catholic, yes. Yeah, I thought that was so good. That's totally what I am. Based. Yeah, no, because cause Pine Sap is like the, you know, uh, Catholic uh, android programmed by Opus Dei, and uh, he can regurgitate uh, magisterial documents and debate with you for hours. I'm the grug brained Catholic that can't do that, can't debate theology very well, but I completely submit to whatever the Catholic Church says, and if you disagree, you're cringe and gay and are probably going to burn to hell because you need to repent and convert. That's my position. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks for having me. All right, see you later. Uh, uh, I, I want to bring even more bass in, but Manlet Zoomer has had his hand up longer. What do you think we should do? Um, I mean, even more bass has more clout. So are we going by clout or by hand raising status? Let I, I love EMB, but let's be fair to Manlet Zoomer. Just said he's been waiting so long, but I love EMB. We'll totally bring him on instantly right. after. Manlet Zoomer, what up? Got to unmute your mic, buddy. Oh, hey, you hear me? Yes. Yeah, bro. Okay. Yeah, sorry. My AirPods are kind of iffy sometimes, so it's hit or miss with these things. Oh, good, buddy. But uh, anyways, yeah, so I watched that episode two of, uh, what? what's it called again? Uh, Mass Logos Avengers? Triumphant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, oh, Mass Avengers. <laughs> Oh, my bad. My bad. Sorry. My bad. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I'm tired. I'm tired. Uh, I, awesome. I jumped the gun. <laughs> Our podcasts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That one. That one. No, 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 no. Uh, Mass of the Ages. Mm -hmm. uh, I heard y'all talking about it earlier. And uh, I don't know. It was, it was weird. I was watching it. It seemed like they were like, they were just the whole time dogging on these very like, you know, I, I don't know. It was very like nitpicky. At one point, you know, they were they were like criticizing that you know the priests in the Novus Ordo will, you know, when they're doing the consecration, they will you know say the, the words of consecration out loud. It's like well, I'm I'm a Byzantine Catholic. You know, we do that too. Like there's a lot of things that they were criticizing in the Novus Ordo. It's like okay, well, we do that. You know, like, but I don't, I don't understand the point. Like, you know, that's kind of the problem I have with that kind of stuff. I don't know what your thoughts on that's a good, that are. 
so what's funny is actually the Novus Ordo is heavily influenced by the Eastern Rite. Um, a lot of people don't know that, but like active participation and like having the congregate sting and stuff like that, that's an Eastern Rite trait that St. Paul the VI wanted to um, like kind of get more in the Roman Rite almost. That it's, and that's actually yeah, a good exactly. point too, because like all these rad trads who think that the Novus Ordo is illicit or invalid or something along those lines, I never hear them talking about the various other rites that are in communion with Rome that have extremely different liturgical practices and things of that nature. And they would have more of an argument if the Latin Mass was completely banned or something along those lines, even though I would still think that the Pope has every right to do that, even though obviously I hope he doesn't do that. But they, they don't really criticize the other rites that are completely different than the Novus Ordo. Um, but for some reason, they think that the Novus Ordo is completely invalid. It doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, yeah. And it's sort of like, you know, there's a lot of things that they, that they dog on that just kind of strike me as like i don't know it's, it, like i said it's just nitpicky it's like you know like we we don't have a problem using like vernacular i mean i'm not saying that the roman right should but you know it's like i mean is that the worst thing in the world you know it's like as long as the, the you know the tradition is still there as long as there's continuity which you could argue there's less continuity in the roman right now but you know, I think it's still there in a lot of ways. So, yeah. <clears throat> Pine Sap. What, now, the Novus Ordo, as it's intended to do, they're they're supposed to use uh, more Latin, and it's supposed to be more in line with uh, the traditional Latin Mass. And as Michael Lofton says, that uh, a, a, a regular person probably wouldn't be able to tell much of a difference between a properly done Novus Ordo and a Latin Mass. So, why do you think that? the Novus Ordo has become allowed to have so much modernity and liturgical abuses in it. Like, is it just, is it not so much the mass order itself in the missile or whatever that it is these poor um, clergy people, I guess, that are doing these things? I, I would say it's the latter where it's just literally people running with the rubrics and, and deciding to do whatever they want. I've seen on um, I've actually seen personally in my life and on YouTube and stuff like that, literally reverently done Novus Ordos. The congregations are as packed and as full of young people as the traditional Latin masses, literally like two for two. I have not noticed a single difference. It's like the same amount of like young families and you can't tell the difference. And literally like the, the uh, reverence that occurs during that, um, that celebration of the Novus Ordo in such a reverent way, it's it's like unmistakable. I mean, I literally remember watching uh, a mass done uh, on YouTube at, um, I, I think it was the Washington Cathedral or something, um, or, or another like that happened in the Netherlands. And it was so reverently done. I was like, if this was literally what had happened after Vatican II in most dioceses, people wouldn't have even had batted an eye at, at, at the updates. They would have just been like, Oh, okay. There's a, like a little bit more vernacular and stuff like that. Okay. That's cool. So, and, and we would have been well on our way. So how does it work? Um, is it just like, there's a, there's a, a bare minimum that you have to check off these boxes of what you're supposed to do in terms of the order of the mess and everything else they just add on. And it's, there's, it's not specifically condemned. So they feel that free to do it. And the main problem is that it's not uh, officially condemned. So they just continue doing it that's basically the issue it's that there's a lot of like it's not so much what's said but what's not said and i think that something that a lot of people have said that would help the life of the church is we just need to get back to uniformity um that was something that trent did really 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 well and it's not that vatican ii didn't do that vatican ii intended to do that but i think we need um some pastoral care over the universal church in regards to the roman right to get us back to that point saying listen we need to bring it back to um doing it this one way um i would almost i i, I would i know he was corrected by the vatican um because he said it as an official directive and the vatican said no this isn't an official directive but i think uh, cardinal Seurat was really 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 uh, great in, in wanting to promote ad orientum being done. Um, I, I don't like the idea of the altar 
being separated out from the tabernacle uh, or tabernacle, sorry, tabernacle, um, where there's like a separation there. I think, I think the altar and the tabernacle need to be together um, because that's not prescribed in the Novus Ordo. It literally, and in fact, I, I think I even heard a directive where there were some dioceses that said, don't do that and like do the opposite. Um, we need to have little elements like that uniform again in the life of the church. And I think if we do that, we're going to see all these problems like just, just dissipate and go away. And, you know, for all the, um, <clears throat> especially in my diocese, for all the father young trads that are being ordained and stuff like that, this is what they're doing at their parishes. I see them, how they celebrate mass and they'll, they'll start small. They'll like generally start with like a weekday mass, but then they'll start like integrating it even into the Sunday mass where they're doing incense, where they're doing ad orientum, where they're doing all these things that literally make people love the mass again. And it is just so awesome. So uh, just to, before I go, uh, you brought up the uh, the altar situation. Uh, so you know where the table thing originated from is actually uh, sort of a perversion of uh, something they wanted to do that's similar to, like you said, you know, they're trying to bring in more things from the Eastern Rite. So in the Eastern Rite, the altar is sort of in the center uh, area so the priest can walk around it, you know, and so that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to take the altar sort of off the wall so the priest could walk around it. But instead, what they ended up doing is just leaving the tabernacle where it was and just bringing a table out, uh, you know, in the center, basically. So it's like, I don't really know how that, like, got mixed up there, but it's, it's just interesting how that happened. That's what they wanted to do, and then that's not what happened. So... But anyways, I'll let uh, EMB get in here and I'll dip out. All right, brother. Thanks for joining. God bless. God bless the Eastern Catholics, too. We need to get more Eastern Catholic representation because those homies are awesome. I want to go to an Eastern Catholic liturgy so bad. Um, All right. Even more If you ever come visit me, I'll bring you to mine. It's really awesome. Let's do it. Do you go there regularly? Um, it's near my school, so I can actually sometimes drive over. I don't go too regularly, about like once every couple of months or so when I manage to get over there, but it's, it's always such a good time. Based. Um, uh, yeah, uh, EMB, you are unmuted. You got to unmute your mic. Hey, how are you? Hey, how the heck are you? How you doing, man? Blessed, blessed, always blessed. Facts. So, um. Yeah, so Ed, Ed from Crosstalk, right? He's he's been he saw one of the, something that you posted uh, on your channel spec, so on your Telegram about cleaning up our language, about not cussing, and and uh, and he totally agreed, and, and we're all making an effort. I think there's a big effort within the movement right now. People are starting to 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 catch on to that, to clean up our language. It's like the one of the last little venial sort of sins that we're we're, we're dealing with, um, but it can corrupt and it can become more of a problem because it shows it's a reflection of like a, a dark inside, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I uh, yeah, like I'm I, I do other stuff, but one of my one of parts of my job is truck driving or whatever, so I'm around truck drivers all the time, and we have mouths like truck drivers, so it's just part of our vocabulary, you know. And um, I, I talked with Pine Sap about it at length in one of our episodes about my favorite curse word or whatever I didn't consider it a curse word is the word for homosexuals that rhymes with yes, ma- that rhymes with yes. maggot and begins with F. And I probably use that word more than any other word in the English language. Um, and I was talking to him because we already discussed it once about how um, you know it's you shouldn't you shouldn't use it it's sinful or whatever but then i was talking to him again and i was like i think we need to go over this again because I think it's really more about the intention because if you're not using it as uh, inten- like intentionally to disparage the dignity of people with homosexual pro- proclivities or whatever, then I really don't see how it's sinful. But then he sent me this great article um, going over how we're supposed to use our language. And the, our language is supposed to be used to bring people to God, right? So that's why you hear like saints that uh, sometimes wouldn't talk at all or they would always think for minutes before they said any type of word or whatever and they were very specific on the words that they chose. Um, And 
it, the thing is, is that even if you're not using it profanely, you should be avoiding words that were majoritarily used to disparage people, even if you're not using it with those intentions. So that word, even though I may just say it as uh, you know, a replacement for weirdo or loser or somebody that I don't like or if I'm just trying to provoke somebody or something like that, I'm still using a word that was historically majoritarily used to uh, disparage people with a certain sexual preference, right? even if that sexual preference is sinful and all that stuff. But because it, it is the word itself was used, major, uh, uh, the majority of which it was used to, um, you know, lessen the dignity of those people, we should avoid using it. Yep, right. So that that's, that's funny because I, I was, uh, my pastor had this, uh, actually, no, my pastor, he had a baby and he had that, that transitional period. Uh, we had a bunch of uh, just guest people, guest pastors, I guess, just come in. And there was one guy who was really based. He had this awesome sermon about uh, disparagement, just dis disparaging uh, titles. And he talked about how um, the so you know the 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 Indians they have uh, this sort of caste system, right? And the caste system, the lower you are, the lower you are in society. Like it's a societal thing. It's a cultural thing too. The people on the bottom are treated much less fairly than the people on the top. And you know you can you can make an argument that there's always been a caste system and life is a caste system life isn't fair. But he was talking specifically about their names. Now the people in the lowest caste system, um, a lot of times they didn't even have last names because they weren't worth. Like who needs a last name? Like it's, it's like the equivalent of being like Jim. Like it's just Jim. Like he's just John or something. Like he doesn't even have. Not that it's a bad name. I'm just saying they didn't even have last names. And not only that, but if you look at their names, what they translate to. They were like stupid, ugly, idiot. Like they weren't nice names. Like they they were always disparaging, and that that weighs on you. And that's that's a lifelong thing. Like imagine if you didn't even have a last name and your first name was like dumb, like idiot. You know what I mean? Like that that actually weighs down a lot, right? Yeah, definitely. And it's just very true. like w with swearing in general. I still uh, every day I fall short of it or whatever, and I catch myself, you know, uh, cursing, and I'm like, ah, oh, you know, like I gotta try to be more um, prudent with my, that's my new favorite word, by the way, prudence, because Pine Sap taught me that. Um, but uh, I got to try to be more prudent with my language and uh, more uh, conscious of, of the words I'm saying and how I'm using them, you know, but it is really hard. I'm from New York City. I drive trucks. You know, everybody curses like it's nothing. It doesn't mean anything. It's just part of our vocabulary. And like, it's just really hard. But it's, it's like the same reason where we don't say uh, like Jesus Christ, um, irreverently right where we don't use the, the lord's name in in uh in vain and people think that using the lord's name in vain just means like saying like gee damn it or something like that you know it, it that's not it it's like using it frivolously frivolously or uh in a joking manner and stuff like that or talking about hell uh in a joking manner telling people to go to hell things of that nature that all is in line with profanity or, or being imprudent with your language that will be venially sin, uh, sinful you know so it's it, it's uh, it's not just about like the common four letter curse words it's about you know trying to be better um with our language in general and besides the religious factor it, it also just uh it sounds better you're able to talk to people uh better and stuff you know so i think that it is definitely something especially for myself who really struggles with it that we should be more conscious of yeah you guys are so pious man can't even man we can't even call gay people the f word that that's we listen. We gave up promiscuous. We were born again, <laughs> completely born again. We gave up promiscuous sex. We we stopped watching pornography. We're knee deep in the scripture and prayer. We fast, almsgiving, give us a charity. Completely born again. Now I can't even call gay people the f word. Just Man, keep... that's a pine sap doesn't want us you to guys... have any fun. That's that's what it is. You think you think that, that he's like some woo. genius magisterial? He he just looks through church documents to see what he can take away from us. That's what he does. Um, <laughs> I'm like scheming over yeah. here. Well, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm, like, I'm like the Joker. Joker, he's joking. You know, mode. I'm like the Joker. I'm like, you that's know, part of your that's part here. of your villainous arc. It Find is, that. dude. Dark sap. Dark, yep. Dark sap. sap is rising. No fun. No fun <laughs> words. No fun things. Only God. It's that's like right. A, yeah. Well, hey, Nick mentioned you uh, on today's stream. Did he in, um, a, in a good way? <laughs> <laughs> in the best way uh Based. he was going someone i i didn't catch the super chat i only caught it real quick it was um he was good he was like yeah basically saying like if you look at other websites and you look at like uh 
Twitch, what they offer. It's just like all worldly things. You see women in hot tubs and stuff and all kinds of like basically softcore and softcore uh, pornography, like like just total degenerate stuff. And then you, he's like, yeah, you look at Cozy and like you just look at just straight up just just the religious content. And there's an abundance of it. And he was like, yeah, there's, you know, there's Spexo, there's, you know, classical theist. He mentioned Crosstalk, the Let's Bible go. study that we do in the mornings. Yeah, so, but it is true. Like, there's an abundance, like, look at all the other things that are going on in the world and all the other places you can find entertainment. You go on Cozy, they, like, there, there's a huge amount of just religious stuff that, that is offered here. Yeah, I'm so happy that Classical Theist is on, uh, is on Cozy. I, I love that guy so much. Like he, I, I knew about classical theist. Like I didn't even un know that he was. I think I was already supporting AF when I found him, but I didn't know that he was associated or supported America First. Like I just saw him. Like I watched uh, some of his uh, videos that I really didn't understand <laughs> because he's he's like pine sap with his like uh, theological words and whatever uh, you know uh, three dollar words every two seconds. But um, it, he's I, got I, the he, best uh, words. Yeah, the best words. He uh, but <laughs> he uh, was definitely uh, his Twitter and stuff was like a definite definitely. Uh, inspiration to me and uh, all the stuff that he would say especially referring to thomas aquinas and stuff um so i was really I, when i when he started mentioning uh nick fuentes and saying that he was and like openly saying that he was america first i was like oh this is awesome but um yeah no so i'm really glad that h him and all these other catholics and religious people are on cozy it's, it's awesome i think this platform is growing and uh what what nick fuentes and his team has has done is awesome yeah, it really, it really is a privilege. I, I mean, I don't go anywhere else now. Like I used to watch every morning. I would watch like uh, I got to watch my base Tucky. Don't even talk to me until I've had my Tucky, my mm -hmm. Tucker Carlson. So I watch Tucker. Car no, I don't even watch other stuff now. I'm just on cozy. Everything I need is right here. Um, yeah. Oh, uh, what Pine Sap, you were talking about actually in your interview about how like you can't enjoy media or anything like secular anymore, bro. I had that like that happened to me like the other day. Really? Yeah. So like regularly now, I, I really don't watch much TV or anything like that. Um, actually, since like I started getting politically red pilled, like every time I would see something, it would be like, oh, well, let's count the Zionist propaganda in here or whatever. But like, uh, <laughs> but um, I, got, I got over that, you know, and like I was like, all right, I got to enjoy it for what it is and just like get past all that stuff. But so then. The, I, I barely have any time anymore because my kids and my job and everything like that. So I really don't have time to sit down and watch something. So the other day I had, uh, I did a side job for somebody where I was just uh, a, a security guard in a car, right? And uh, I just had to ch chill and make sure that nobody like came in or anything like that. So I was uh, chilling in this car or whatever, and I had my my laptop connected to my Wi-Fi hotspot or whatever. And I was like, oh, you know what? I'm just gonna, I, I, could, wa I could watch whatever I want. Hold on. What the heck? All right, you guys keep talking. <laughs> My daughter just woke up. I got to go put her back to sleep. That's <laughs> Sorry totally about fine, that. Man. Hold on. Yeah, we'll hold down the fort, okay? Oh. Unacceptable and unprofessional, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Family man, dude, what's going on? <laughs> crazy, crazy. Dude, it's insane. Dude, when we did that stream the other day on your channel, dude, that was so much fun. I had a great time. I was thinking about that. Uh, yeah, God, God's plan. So, so America Plus looking into Catholicism. What better person would be at the right, like just right there at the right time to just answer any questions? Gets invited to the Rosary. Every every ans every question he has, you know, he could just have answered right there. Professional and uh, God's plan, in my opinion. It's God's plan, dude. I, God lays down the building bricks or, at, or building blocks, and it's just amazing. Like, we don't even understand everything till it's actually done, and we see the work that's already been built only by him. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's such a treasure. Yeah, and, and America Plus, he's sharp. He's 16. He's, he's like a baby. He's like, you know, much, much younger than uh than i originally thought because of the way that he carries himself and and everything and the, i i can't I, I can't fathom again like just kind of piggybacking on what you said i can't even imagine how many people are just listeners just chilling and listening to what you have to say and just to think that you have a positive impact in their life a spiritual actual discipline of always always being on top of your game uh, because you don't know who's going to be listening. You don't know who you just talked out of a, a suicide or, or just, just you know, 
uh, awoken their their minds to like you know a terrible situation a bad relationship or something or something just makes sense and i hear that a lot about nick too in the super chat people will be like yeah it was a lost person and then you know i got brought here so that's why we always got to be sharp you never know god's gonna bring you another test and you gotta ace it and you have been absolutely and it i mean that that's the biggest thing like it's it's not about the money it's not about the fame it's not about any of any other thing than just changing people's lives that's all right i mean that's the whole reason why i i want to do this for like the rest of my life frankly you know is is just help people in any way that i can all right we are back <laughs> That's uh, the problem with uh, having a two-year-old that we just took out of a crib and put her in her own bed, and now she thinks that she could just get up in the middle of the night and uh, <laughs> all good. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know what you guys are talking about, but I'll get back to what I was talking about. Oh, star of the, sh <laughs> yeah, star of the show yeah. here. Um, yeah, so all right. So We're just having a wholesome moment. It was nice. awesome. Based. Um, yeah, so like I said, I, I was in this, in this car, and I was like, I had eight hours to do whatever I wanted. So I, I got my laptop, hooked it up to my Wi-Fi uh, hotspot on my phone, and I was like, oh, I have all these shows I could watch or whatever, right? And I just started watching stuff, and like I would watch it for five minutes, and I'd be like, this is just so boring. <laughs> like I was like, this is not entertaining to me or whatever. I don't, I'm not interested in anything. You know, I tried watching Jack Reacher, which I watched like uh, a couple episodes or whatever, and it's actually kind of surprising because like it's the first show so far that there's like this six foot five jacked white guy who was like the good guy and i was like oh this is pretty cool <laughs> but then i'm just like no it's not doing it for me or whatever now the only time that i watch movies or anything like that is with uh is like with my family or whatever and oh so nick nick uh when the whole drama with Jaden was going on he mentioned that he watched the show euphoria right talk about the most degenerate thing you've ever seen in your life i watched the first two episodes oh. i i can't watch it anymore it's literally it's it's porn it's literally porn basically it's, it is yo know, so Dude, I watched the, the, the first is. the first episode right first of all there's a tranny that's a main character that it, it, it like and they don't even really mention that it's a tranny right like it, it that's not a thing like and she just he he just walks around and people just accept oh it's a tranny whatever like they, they just treat it like it's a normal person and um <laughs> which I probably shouldn't say it like that because I'm delegitimizing his dignity or whatever. But like, you know what I'm saying? Like they don't like act surprised that there's a guy dressing like a girl, right? They just treat it like it's a girl. So, um, and then the first episode, a married guy has sex with the tranny, right? And like, the one thing I will say is that like the characters are believable and like you're kind of interested in the story, but the amount of explicit drug use, nudity and sex that there is, is so excessive and unnecessary that it's just like repulsive to watch. Like, and I don't understand how the show is so popular because it, it's just disgusting. And then the second episode, there's a whole seg segment where they're going over like penis pictures, right? And they're showing like literal penis pictures and porn sites where they're showing full on like penetration. It was disgusting. I was like, how is this a TV show? It is absolutely the most, it's like every form of degeneracy you could ever imagine, like all over the place. And that's what they're doing. Like it's like just normalizing this explicit sexual degenerate stuff. And like it, what this does is it like, I'm not going to go boomer mode and say like, oh, people shouldn't play violent video games because then they'll shoot up school or whatever. But like put consuming this media, especially at a young age, definitely has an effect on your mind where you're desensitized and think that this stuff is normal and OK. It is absolutely grotesque and completely against everything that you should stand for. Yeah, you, you nailed it. You, normalized is, yeah, is, is definitely the motif. Mm -hmm. You can see it, uh, an actual graduated degradation in our art um man i i remember reading old older books in high school and there would be i mean there was a, it was it's i mean you're reading it you're not watching it it's one thing but there were times i remember you know i, I would be 13 14 years old and there would be a point in time where two characters would have sex and the way that they would write it i forgot what book i was reading but it was just like and then they turned off the lights. Like they didn't have to go all into anything. And like you know what happens it's, after? Yep. You know, a guy, guy and a girl get in a room and they turn the light off. You know, they don't. They don't. You know, read the Bible. You need the. You need the light on to read the Bible. The, the so, last. The last show. That not doing that. The last show that I watched was uh, like like the act, like a full length show was the show Power, right? Which is total ghetto nonsense, right? But it was entertaining and. 
every time there was a sex scene, it was like legit five minutes long explicit sex scene. And I'm like, this is completely unnecessary to the story or the plot. Like you watch like these shows that are on like network television and they want to imply that they're having sexual relations. They like, they kiss and then it fades away or something, or they like yep. just cut to them like in bed next to each other and they're, and they're talking. And you can imply from the context of the show that that's what happened. You don't need to go into specific detail. Like what other reason is there to show this explicit Explicit sexual content than to desensitize and normalize it and and get people aroused and things of that nature. Like it is so disgusting and unnecessary and uh, excessive. I told yeah, I totally agree. And there there's a crosstalk uh, episode about that about beta programming where it's basically it's 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 a it's actually an actual deliberate satanic device to to desensitize. And if you look at all of the craziest you know, I mean, this is a little off the goop, but like the craziest like MK Ultra programming, you know, it it is legitimized in the way that uh, they put thousands and thousands of people and spent thousands of thousands of dollars to optimize this brainwashing. And what do they do? What are one of the first things that they do to break down the psyche is show uh, and bombard the brain with grotesque and and war and snuff and things like this. That it 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 actually does. You know, it, that's like that. That's like the most exaggerated form, I would say, like the MK Ultra programming. Some people don't even think it's real. No, it is real because we clearly like funded it and like you know looked into it. Um, so it's definitely a, like a real thing. How viable? You know, you look at you look at the the natural degradation of society. Like I said, like how things were and how things are now, and you can see a huge graduated difference. Not only that, but like, man, the it, it just seems more and more like the boomers, like you were saying, the satanic panic people are just being more and more vindicated and right every single day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and <clears throat> I posted this thing that in 1962, they took prayer out of public school. And um, obviously in the 1960s, it was probably the worst decade of American history with the sexual revolution and uh, wrote, um, what was it? No, that was the 70s. Um, the Heart Cellar Act and all of this stuff that radic and the rock and roll stuff um, that radically changed American culture forever. Now, obviously, we can talk about the Protestant Reformation and that downfall all leading up to that and stuff like that. But just from an American perspective in the last hundred years, the 1960s were definitely the beginning of a rapid decline in the social values of America. And you see that this correlation, I was thinking like, oh, well, if I post this, people are going to be like, oh, well, what about the sex, uh, the sex revolution and the drugs and the rock and roll and all that stuff? And it's like, yeah, but they all correlate with prayer because what they're doing is they are taking God and mora Christian morality out of society. And what are you left with? You're left with this secular hellhole that we are currently living in where everything is permissible. And that's what liberalism is. Liberalism is, liberalism is that there is no objective morality and when you have no objective morality you don't have god perfectly put yeah i would say static morality is pretty much static morality is the only thing that anchors us towards uh purifying our society and we are depurifying our society one step at a time by giving concessions to these liberal institutions which is why I have been making a, a solid effort, and I think Dalton talks about this, Kai talks about this, how we should reclaim these institutions. I don't want to give up on college. I know, Pine's up, you're in college. Like, I don't want to get, I, I, I get it. I get it. It's rough. You, you go there and you learn about how white people, like, are terrible and there's no history being taught. There's no, you know, there's all these concessions made to uh, diversity and in the name of diversity, rather. And it's just, it's just rough, but I don't, I don't think we should give I, I, we're not weak we're not losers we don't give up I don't think we sh we should take back these institutions and reimplement um more god into it and just to have and actually have viable alternatives so when I came out with that hymn you know people had things to say about it they 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 were like hey this sounds like green day well it does uh and that's on purpose because the song he has made me glad it literally comes from psalm 100 i mean if you have a problem with the lyrics you're gonna you're gonna have to take that up with king david mm -hmm. first off uh Thanks. second off the psalms are literally put to music that music that we don't have access to anymore and how did they mm -hmm. play that music i mean there are some in some bibles they do have still the original instructions this is played on the the jewish harp or whatever it's called i forget um this jewish is harp, called but... this is for it's like a it's like a it's like a harp yeah no, was, that's what it's called the jewish harp the jewish harp yeah correct <laughs> that's the scientific name yeah the jewish harp 
and uh, it'll have instruction for the chief musician, and then it has like the cella, right? The pauses mm -hmm. for for like the reflection, and then the pause in the music, possibly even because these these were psalms, and then literally put to music. And how did they arrange those the 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 songs? Well, they weren't like, well, we got a harp, like let's use it was like they they utilized their modern tone and the instruments that they had so what i'm doing is i took mo like scripture you know it, it, it was a cover it's not like i even made this up like you can't, can't even take this up with me to be honest but you take this and you make it in a modern way and this is one way i think we could take back our institutions stop listening to globalist green day the guy you, you go to their you go to their concerts they're counter counter signaling trump they're they're a cog of the American system, the American evil American regime. You go there and you get the 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 yellow and blue light show, the Ukraine fl like colors flying. That's how you know it's evil. I mean, it, they're they're just they suck. They stink. Okay, um, you can listen to uh, this new hymn instead, uh, or stop listening to you know the worldly sin empowering uh, rap music that you know is dirty and you know is doing is doing a an evil work on your soul and listen to Bryson Gray who does who by the way is a rapper who's never been high doesn't rap about drugs women or, or money or anything like that a lot of scriptural basis I mean it's not like he's reading straight out of Psalms you know he's a creative output there that's what rap is it's about the lyrics and there's a lot of wholesome stuff there and even with alternatives like with the parallel you know society really the parallel economy and the parallel society that we're trying to set up we don't have, you know, I, w Twitter is an important thing to have. It is an important space to, to occupy. Let's make it, let's make a, you know, an effort to, to continue that we have these platforms. This, this is how we win. But also, I mean, we have Gab. We do have places where we can, we can slowly sort of take back. It's a, this is a short term versus a long term sort of effort. And uh, one, in general, I think taking back these sort of liberal institutions, putting simple things, putting prayer back in school, um, you know, cleaning up some of the grotesque movies, making it harder to access, making it illegal, straight up illegal to sell or, or consume pornography. I mean, if that would get rid of all of pornography, if it was illegal, right? I mean, it's pretty simple. Take back these institutions. That's what I say. Yeah, and I think... I uh, uh, what you're what you're doing with uh, the Psalms and appropriating it to like modern type of music is really good. What Bryson Gray is awesome, besides some of his heretical stuff. Uh, but uh, yeah, <laughs> I think um, you know uh, there's a lot of purity spiraling in terms of uh, art where people go, you can't listen to rap. Rap isn't real music and stuff, and it's just a perversion of music and blah blah blah. All these like wignat type and even boomers or whatever. And it's like, well, you can go back to like rock and roll where they were promoting the same thing and even other forms of music. Every single popular song now is promoting promiscuous sex, drug use, whatever. It doesn't matter if you're listening to indie rock, rap, rock, or whatever. They're all promoting degenerate anti-Logos stuff, right? So it's like, what are you going to do? You're going to listen to Gregorian chants all day in the gym? Based if you do, but not everybody's going to do that. Literally, exactly. Know? But, that's that's right. exactly what I said. Like, you guys are LARPers. What do you put mm. on in the car? Everything you listen to is in Latin, mm. Gregorian chants all day? No, yeah. you go to the gym, you put on... I don't know, bass hunter. Right. Yeah. Like it's it's so true. Yeah. Everybody everybody listens to music that is not in line with Christian morality. We know that or whatever, right? And we're not going to stop that. It's a, it's another result of the industrial revolution. Technology is going to progress. Music is going to change. Culture is going to shift. All that stuff. So instead of purity spiraling and larping, do something about it, and you know, appropriate that music and make music that people want to listen to, but make it about Christ. You know, make it about good things, you know, good, have good morals and, and things of that nature. Because if we're going to purely spiral, I understand the whole like modern art is nonsense. And I completely agree that we've disrupted objective beauty and all that stuff or whatever. But we're not, we don't have time machines. We can't do any of that stuff. You know, um, there's only so much we could really do. And I think that instead of complaining about it and purity spiraling and condemning everybody who enjoys certain things, we should, you know, be creating and lifting people up. And I think through that medium, what you and other people are doing is really great. Hey, kind words, kind words. Well, you know what? Hey, I apologize for stealing your co-host uh, the other day for the stream, but man, God, we were talking well, right right when you you uh, you went to go to, uh, take care of your daughter. I was saying uh, God's plan. I had America Plus, a young, awesome conservative, uh, very young, uh, in still in high school, and uh, just so happened Pine Sap was right there, and uh, he had all these questions, asking about you know 
the rosary and then how you know where he's just literally like level one catholic and it's just like uh but what we were saying that little wholesome moment was you you know to, you, we can't zoom out and we don't know god's plan but that's why we have to be on top of these things be sharp because we don't know who's going to be there at the right place at the right time to fulfill his plan and you know spread the gospel do these sorts of things i don't know how many I, I don't know because some people are just lurk. They don't. They don't. Maybe they don't chat. They just listen in the car or something, in between shifts, uh, work or something, and uh, you don't know who you're, who's listening out there. And that's uh, it's just an incredible thing to have you guys doing doing you, what you do best, which is talk about uh, Catholicism, scripture, and, and venerate God. I mean, someone out there. I mean, and I, I don't know what you're. I call it the uh, the the BDR. You know what a KDR is, right? In a in a video Kill death game. ratio. Right, so I don't know what your BDR is, your blessed to death ratio, but I'm sure it's pretty. I'm sure it's at least like four, four or five point oh. I mean, for every one person who thinks, what are these these guys? I remember one guy was like, what are they like comparing sin? Like, what is this the purity yeah, show yeah, yeah, or yeah. something? What is this the sin and show? Like, the sin show? Yeah, no. It's like for every one guy is like, all right, maybe this isn't for me. There's five other people who are like, wait, I think I'm going to follow Christ now. So appreciate. I love that. that. Thanks, brother. Hey. But, uh, we're, I don't we're know gonna, if anyone We're going to get you to convert soon. Don't worry. We're going to win you over. <laughs> yeah, you're doing a work, doing a Catholic work in my heart right now, bro. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right, brother. We'll talk to you later. Thank you so much. GEMB. God bless. All right. God bless. Good night. God bless, brother. Right, see. If anybody else wants to raise their hand, we'll take one or two more. If not, we will end it because it is almost 2 o'clock in the morning. But uh, <laughs> uh, let's see. I think Zeno was raising his hand. Zeno, do you want to talk? Raise your hand if you want to talk. We'll let you in. And if anybody else wants to join real quick, it's t.me slash spexo. Mm -hmm. oh, there he is. Okay. All right. We'll take him and then if one person, we'll, we'll take him and one other person if they want to go. If not, we'll go. Zenu, what's up? You got to unmute your mic. Yo. Hey, man. How's it going, bro? Hey, thanks. Thanks, uh, thanks for having me, man. Absolutely. Really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, first off, uh, Spexo, uh, you're in my prayers, man. Very sorry for your loss. Thank um, you, brother. M my mother went through the same thing, so I uh, <clears throat> completely understand what, you, what you're going through. Thank you. Um, yeah, and uh, so as for my question, um, I was uh, listening to your podcast the other day, uh, actually about sex, to continue the sex conversation you guys were having earlier. Um, and I, you know, I have, I have some issues regarding sex with the church and this is, um, uh, a problem I wanted to bring up and that, you know, uh, NFP is allowed, correct? Mm -hmm. But I, I don't understand the difference between NFP and birth control. It, it seems like it's kind of the same thing, but one is allowed and one isn't. So I want to get your comments on that. Sure. Well, natural family planning is basically what you're doing is you're taking your wife's natural cycle into consideration and not having sex on the days that she is most fertile. Now, that doesn't eliminate the possibility of her getting pregnant on other days. It is just natural family planning. It is only having sex when, uh, when she isn't the most fertile. And there's nothing wrong with that because you are not using any type of synthetic uh, conception, no, not conception, uh, contraception um, to stop life. And that is what is sinful. It's sinful when you purposely prevent the conception of life. So you're not doing that with natural family planning. With birth control and with other contraceptions like condoms, you are stopping the natural process from ha um, from happening through outside sources. Whether you're chemically altering your body to not produce the correct hormones or whatever the case may be, or if you're using a physical blocker like a condom to prevent that natural process from happening. Um, that's what I would say on it. What about you, Pines Up? Well, I would say it's it's not a perversion of the natural faculty that you're engaging in. The problem with contraception is you're physically doing something to your body to try and essentially use your wife as like kind of a masturbatory uh, like device. A, yeah, right. like a like a sex doll, basically. And so um, with natural family planning, it always has to be open to life. It can't be contraceptive inherently because contracep contraception inhibits, it, there's, there's no openness to life in that. And if, if by chance, um, you know, by the grace of God, you got, uh, a, a woman got pregnant in that interaction, it would have been like one out of a million. 
right? So it's a perversion of the sexual act, whereas with NFP, you're not actually impeding anything. There's no impediment. You're not, you know, using a condom. You're not using, um, uh, you know, oral birth control, uh, that, that uh, birth control pills that the w woman would take or something like that. And it's, it's understood in that way. Likewise, the church has classes on it and they, they teach it to be done at certain times and what have you with due consideration. So it's not just a cut and dry thing of, oh, Catholic contraception. It's, it's a very, very like, um, set out system so that people aren't, you know, just, just using their wives as like sex dolls, you know, it always allows for life it always allows right, for but life. isn't that what it's used for though like i i feel like if if somebody is take for example taking advantage of it and using nfp not to get their wife pregnant that's what it would be used for here so here's the problem with that though the um essentially the i'm trying to figure out how to explain this Essentially, the problem with that is that even if people might be trying to pervert NFP, it's not by itself contraception. It's not contraceptive, right? Because we have to ask what it what are the factors at play? Okay, so you know we all know how how sex works, right? We all know how the no explain, please go into detail. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, you know I have no idea penis, how this works. Yeah, way, right. So. A penis goes in the vagina, right? <laughs> and um <laughs> clip that somebody clip that. just that part just that all right go. <laughs> <laughs> and um with that there is there is the the act of of conception right of of conceiving a child now what contraception does is um i actually believe it or not can't quite remember the whole like uh uh a biological aspect of like uh birth like oral birth control that women take, but I, I think it has something to do stops with stops your it, ovulation like, cycle. It stops your ovulation. Yeah, cycle. yeah. It, it basically like throws off everything to not like you know make make the woman um, uh, have one of her eggs become fertile. And likewise with the uh, the act of using a condom, there's a physical barrier there. So what you have is an impediment to any remote chance for life with nfp there's a very good likelihood the woman could still get pregnant very good likelihood right and so it's not something there's no artificial or outside thing being taken in to make it contraceptive even if we want to go to the the root of contraception you know onanism right the the act of pulling out before one would spill their seed that's not also being done so well, that, you're in the Bible too, right? Right. And and that's actually where we get the understanding that contraception is sinful, right? So in that act, nothing is nothing is contraceptive, nothing is going wrong. Because we almost could think of like the the sort of like counter argument, right? So like would the sex that you had with your wife be contraceptive if let's say it was the height of her fertility period and she just happened to not get pregnant? No, right? It wouldn't be contraceptive just because she didn't happen to get uh, get pregnant because you did not impede anything in that natural act. You didn't practice onanism. You didn't um, issue any sort of birth control or anything like that. The natural act went through in its normal way and there was nothing implemented in there. So we have to think about it as what is the act being done was going on. With regards to fertility cycle and stuff like that, you know, that's an outside thing in terms of the woman is can still get pregnant no matter what, right? So it's still always open to life. And it's that openness to life that separates it from contraception. And actually, just, just to clarify, we can actually do a separate... I would like to look more into, like, apologetics for NFP. I think it's an area I could improve in a little bit more, but I hope I kind of sufficiently answered also, yeah, it's it, it's kind of um, you know the 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 phrase legalese. It, it it's like it's kind of like that. It, it feels like it's a weird gray area for me, where it's it's kind of like it's like you you guys can have sex even though it's not likely that she's gonna get pregnant. But you know, 
It, it, you, you guys are doing it for the right thing. That, that, that's no. kind of how I feel when I hear that. Well, know? sex sex isn't specifically designed just for, for life. It is a marital act of love between you and your wife. 100%. Right. Yeah, I so, agree. Yeah. so it's not like you're only having sex just to have a child. The the Catholic teaching is that when you have sex with your wife, it needs to be open to life. You can't be uh, blocking life. So with NFP, uh, it's not it's not blocking. You're not purposely trying to block life. You are using her natural facilities that God has created to uh, have the less likely chance of conceiving. You know what I'm saying? So it's not like that. But um, I was trying to find something because I remember reading something that natural family planning isn't supposed to be abused like, oh, we're just going to use this forever just so we never have children or something like that. It's supposed to be done in circumstances where maybe you're not uh, financially. Well, I, I was looking at Vatican II about that, and I didn't really see anything. And it's uh, Vat Vatican II didn't have anything on NFP as far as I'm aware. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, however, though, I wanted to bring up this interesting point. So actually, prior to Vatican II, Pope Pius XI wrote um, that it was acceptable for couples to um, have sexual relations on uh, days where the woman would actually be less fertile. And also NFP is not, I'm reading it right now, it's not only designed for preventing uh, conception. It's also used to, uh, to get pregnant. Like it's just basically looking at her cycle and when and knowing when she is at the highest likelihood of uh, of right. conceiving, right? Of conceiving. So if you if natural family planning, it's like okay, now we want to get pregnant. Let's check the cycle, and then that's when we're going to do the act so that she has the highest likelihood of getting pregnant. And then other times, if you don't want to have a baby right away, like for example, my wife had an emergency C section for our our, uh, our, our first child, right? So she couldn't get pregnant. Uh, like they said, you need to wait a certain amount of time before you get pregnant again, or there could be serious health risks, right? So in a situation like that, if you want to have sex with your wife still, but you also don't uh, want her to get pregnant, but you also don't want to obviously use birth control or anything else, then that would be another instance of using natural family planning, you know? But um, I do agree that it shouldn't be abused. It shouldn't be just like, oh, well, we're never going to, you know. There's another good example. Think about when your wife's pregnant, when you, she initially gets pregnant. You're allowed to actually have sexual relations while she's pregnant, too. I did not know that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, as I, as far as I remember, I think in moral theology, you're allowed to have um, sex while, while your wife's pregnant. Yeah, and that's actually, I don't know if it's a heresy, but I know that it is not a Catholic belief. Like there's like, there's like this belief where like sex should only be used to conceive a child. Like every time you have sex, you should only be doing it for the main purpose of having a child, but that's yeah, not what. Yeah. The, not to sound like a, a yeah. total degenerate, but I'm just curious about like the rules around this because like, yeah, I, I'm a guy. Like, this is something I deal with, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure I'm doing the right thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. Yeah, man, absolutely. You know, and if you're um, not bringing in any outside contraceptive thing or practicing onanism, you're good. You're totally okay. fine. Yep. All right. All right. Thanks for the, thanks for the question. Uh, God bless yeah, you. Thanks, man. Have a good day. All right, appreciate it. All right, I'm pretty sure that's it. Nobody else wants to ask questions, so I think that's a good place to end it. We did almost four hours. Um, yeah, man. That was pretty good. So I think we're going to do our papacy episode uh, hopefully Sunday night. I know you have church, though, right, on Sunday nights? I have church, but by the time I ended the one night when you were actually doing the interview with David, I I got on at a considerable time to be able to kind of watch you guys. So I, I don't think I actually go as late as I think I do. It might be maybe a little later than like at my, for my time, like 8 p.m. sharp. But like, I I think we can fit it in. Awesome. I think it could totally work. Cool. So right now we have a plan. We're going to do a papacy episode on Sunday night. Um, all about the history of the papacy, the importance of the papacy, the apologetics against orthodox, what, like refuting their points of why the papacy isn't necessary or whatever. All things regarding that. Um, then we are going to start a series uh, basically going in-depth on Vatican II and uh, covering, like, because all of the misconceptions, I mean, I know we've covered it before, but we're actually going to go, like, in-depth. I think Pine Sap wants to go over, like, each specific document, maybe, like, the history of how, what, how it came to fruition and what the overall uh, proper view to have on it is, I guess. Uh, so that should be interesting. It's going to be probably a multi-part uh, series.
it'll be awesome man i'm excited <laughs> awesome all right cool uh so you could find me at telegram on at t.me slash spexo you could find pine sap at t.me slash narrow way florentine narrow way florentine narrow way florentine awesome all right thank you guys for joining god bless all of you and uh we'll see you on a uh, sunday night god bless bye